OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, it's bang on half past seven. It is Wednesday morning. You're very welcome along. It's Sharon Ashling with you all the way through until 10. Ashling, how are you? Good, Jer. How are you? I'm still alive. How are you? <laughs> Just about, yeah, yeah. Uh, my back's a little bit sore, but other than that, I was surprised that that I wasn't as sore as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> what were your times like? Um, I don't know, because I do remember um, when we got oh, you into... you lost your time? In, yeah, oh, no, no. I got into the river. I knew that was never going to stay on. So for people at home, basically it stayed on with, you know, the wristband you get if you're going to a festival or anything like that. Like, it was paper. And then the thing was quite heavy, the timer thing. But obviously yours stayed on. But I knew straight away mine wasn't going to stay on. Well, ours all stayed on because we had full wetsuits. That, yeah, like, that uh, was the other thing. Kept it limpid like <laughs> um, but yeah so I fell off so I didn't know my times I got 113 overall alright oh, so you got an overall time yeah okay. yeah 113 overall so which I don't know is that accurate because I am um, I was a few minutes after you getting in the water ah, so, um, so I do think of minutes. I was up there with uh, Tommy was 111 wasn't he right well did you you must have finished pretty close to him yeah because I could see him right at the end yeah right well then so, I did then you definitely beat him um, oh I don't know I don't know if I did but <laughs> um, he's he's going to be on in 20 minutes so uh, yeah we'll just say I did yeah I definitely was around 112 I think it had to have been but yeah, I, I was happy enough. But yeah, when you were saying about the wetsuit, so I had a, a try suit because we had asked Carolyn Hayes that time uh, she came in and spoke with us and I asked, well, that won't be OK. And she thought it would have been. But they were saying to me, maybe it was because we did the try, try, try. They were sort of afraid. They were saying, you know, are you a good swimmer? And I was like, yeah, really fast, yeah. <laughs> and Adrian was laughing at me. I was like, just let me in that river. I have not trained for this not to get in that river. <laughs> and uh, for anybody, we are literally at the river's edge. I'm next. ready to jump in, yeah. yeah. And so they said, hang on a second. And so they were just concerned that you might sink. Yeah. Um, I don't know. How does it help you? The wet? The, oh, it's buoyancy aid. Oh, okay. It's like wearing a, a, a giant kind of uh, protection. That's so you had an advantage then? Oh, totally, yeah. Oh, I swim, it, it turns out the swim is really easy. You can't. You, well, one you can walk. It's also not that deep. It just wasn't deep at all. And uh, the other thing is that, like, you float. You're yeah. like a, you're like a little life raft mm. with flippers. God, I should have had the wetsuit on then. Yeah, I thought the swim was probably the easiest bit. I would have liked that to have been longer <laughs> and cycles have been less. <laughs> Cycle was tough. The cycle's only tough because you didn't do any cycling, though. I didn't do any cycling. And that's the thing. If you did, like, a little bit of cycling, yeah. you'd find the cycling easy because mm. uh, you're, you're running, you're like... Phoom. Who's that? Yeah, I know. I was raging with myself that I hadn't got the bike. I got the bike two days before, and I got on it the day before. I'm not even going to lie. Uh, look, uh, but it's definitely the type of thing that if you did the cycle for 10 days in a row, at the end of that, you'd be, like, 50% faster. Yeah. Because even the gears, I was even like, you know, we were going up small hills. You all said they weren't hills at all. I thought they felt like hills. <laughs> and I was trying to put up and down the gears and stuff. And I was looking at other people and they knew exactly what they were at. And I was like, geez, you know, even those sort of things, I, I think I would have been in that bit faster because you went by me on the bike. Uh, Shane, yeah, I was me and Shane started around the same time, but he took off. Same with Tommy then and Brian as well. You were 11th of 128 females and you were second in your age group. That's not bad. Okay, I'll take that. Yeah, I'll take that for sure. What about you? Did you get your times? Uh, I did get my times. I need to look them up here. Not that I know them. Because uh, you were right. You were beside, You went by me in the bike and I've seen radio. you on the run. Uh, I was 117. Jeez, that's brilliant. Well, uh, I, I'm blaming my inability to get out of my wetsuit. Right? <laughs> that's what Adrian said to me. He's like, the transitions, Ashing, you were insanely fast. I think I actually, at one stage, got my bike and threw my bike. And the organiser was like, what? She can't do that. And I was gone. Uh, so, yeah, I probably could get to talk to time for that one. <laughs> so that, that when, when we add in your penalties. Uh, yeah, so that, that's all right. You know, it's, it's, um, my bike time was pretty good. The swim time was good, but the run, not so good. I just uh, cannot run. It's very difficult when you get off the bike and that was something I hadn't practiced a hell of a lot. I did the bike in the gym and then run onto the treadmill but my legs were like 
jelly like you know when we were coming you you get off the bike you put your bike up and then you you go run around out of the place and back onto the road yeah the, I could not feel <clears throat> my legs whatsoever at that point and I thought no I can't actually do this I can't and somehow it actually just it eases off doesn't it it does totally after like I mean, does it, does it ease off? I don't know. It's certainly, it gets easier. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. Oh, fair, fair enough. And so, will you do it again? Yeah, I definitely would. Yeah, it's 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 so out of my comfort zone. Like I, I can't remember the last time I did anything on my own. You know, individually. Like, always had a team around me, so uh, it was so out of my comfort zone. Like even going to, I was so nervous. I was like, oh god, you're completely dependent on yourself. But it's it was very, a good buzz. It's very intimidating to yeah. do it first. It's very intimidating to not know, do I have all the stuff that I need to have? Like mm-hmm. the checklist is something that you uh, definitely, and the whole way down, I think I stopped the car twice to make sure I had the stuff that I think I needed. And then you get there and it's over and it's great. Yeah. And it's like, and it doesn't really matter if you don't have something unless you're Tommy and you didn't have runners. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like once, once you have your, once you're there, you're there. Yeah. And once you've done it once, I think it takes the mystery out of it. But yeah, the, the buzz is great. It's, like it's the unknown because even getting into the river, I think I would have liked to start before a lot of people because we were sort of stopping because you you You're had at to the look end. up, yeah, and you were in you know swimming into people, things yeah. like that. So exactly, so we we waited to the end thinking we'd be the slow swimmers here, but actually we would have been some of the fastest swimmers if we just started at the start and got yeah. out of the way of everybody else. So I wish we did start earlier on. Well, next year, and then um, was there something else I was going to ask about that? Uh, anyway, it'll come back to me. Uh, if you want to get in touch, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Or, of course, you can leave a comment on the YouTube stream. The hashtag is OTBAM. And we're brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. As I said, Tommy's coming up in a few minutes' time. So, no doubt, we'll talk about me at that point. There you go. Football pod, 750. Sarah Dunham at 8.10 uh, to talk about the weekend's hurling and uh, to look forward uh, to next weekend's sports news with Carl at 8.35. Matt Williams at 8.50 reflecting on the Leinster performance of the weekend and whether or not this is actually any good for the league where somebody's scoring 70 points in the quarterfinals of competition. Not great. David Myler at 10 past nine and some Tommy Ball's goodness coming your way at half nine. Uh, we should talk about me the bit here. We'll talk me the bit more with Tommy, but specifically uh, the abuse that GA players are getting at the minute. Yeah, um, I think the McEntee family as a whole, um, it's... It's just been insane what what abuse they have had to go through in the last few days. Obviously, Andy McEntee uh, resigned as Mead manager after six years. Uh, he's put a lot of time and effort into into Mead football. Uh, it's not due to lack of trying. You know, he's used an incredible amount of players over that time. And yeah, the sacrifice, as many people know, is phenomenal. So just online, there's just been an incredible amount of abuse. Um, you can see now the, the tweet that Shane McIntyre had put up. So this is in context to a now deleted tweet. Um, a Twitter user incorrectly accused the, the Mead County Board of paying €4,000 for Shane McIntyre's flight home from a tour of Mali with the Defence Forces. He came home that time to, to play against Dublin in the Leinster semi-final. And that was completely incorrect. And he's saying there that, you know, the flights cost him €1,000. He paid for them. And he then paid another €500 to change it and make an extra train. And um, online abuse letters to the house. You can put yourself forward for these roles or you can tweet about it. One takes a bit more conviction. It's insane that he has to go and do things like that, you know, that he actually has to tweet out uh, something like that. But uh, fair play to him, and rightly so, because, you know, people writing up that he 4,000 euro from the county board, like, that's crazy amount of money and I mean, never uh, would have uh, happened. Uh, like, uh, so, but if, if, the, if the captain of your team is away for work and uh, you get flown back in, like club teams all around the country have been flying players back from America for years for years. championship matches. So even if it had happened, like... Do you not want your captain playing? Exactly. In the in the biggest game of the season in Leinster, like, you know, yeah, it, the the cost of running an intercounty team is several hundreds of thousands. Mm-hmm. This is really it would have been a drop in the ocean. He should be refunded that thousand euro, that fifteen hundred euro. He should get that money back. He should not be out of pocket for having been in Mali representing his country. Absolutely. So it, I, 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 yeah. I, when I, I first read, he's, he's in the army. Yes, yeah. And when I first read it, that's what I first thought. I said, surely he should actually be refunded that, you know. Um, That's expenses, I I suppose, travel expenses. And 
for him to come back while he's away with the defence forces to, to get an extra training in. I believe he gets like one trip or holiday, uh, something like that is the way it works. And like, that's how he chose to spend his. I just think it, it's ridiculous for these people that are, are, you know, sitting at home behind computers writing this abuse and surely they could not be involved even at club level. In, in any way because if they were they, they would understand even a small bit what the sacrifice that goes in for the likes of Shane and, and Andy for for six years now it's a 24-7 job like uh, yes we're not happy as Mead fans look it's, it's not been great especially in, in recent times but you know it's not for lack of trying and you know he was in Division 1 Super 8 there has been good times it's just from about 2019, I suppose, it just fell apart a small bit. But yeah, it doesn't matter that he does not deserve that abuse, you know. And would this be typical of, of Meath fans or is this like a small pocket of Meath fans? Oh, definitely a small, small minority. But like, I think it's across the GA. We have definitely seen it, you know, with other managers like Declan Bonner recently. You know, you, you've seen there's been abuse there. You know, you, you, I get it if you don't like the, the style they play or they're not coming up with the results. I get all of that. But when it starts getting personal, um, letters to the house, that is wrong on every level. And no person should have to put up with something like that, especially in a voluntary organisation. You know, because it's, it's an amateur game. You know, it's it's just it's hard to comprehend. Uh, it it is it's hard to comprehend how somebody thinks that that type of stuff is okay. And obviously, in this specific instance, it's the accusation that was levelled against Shane McIntyre that has provoked him. But the the other bit is obviously the letters to the house, and I think his sister was talking about the abuse that their dad was getting as well. So it's obviously deep seated, and they've they've clearly been suffering it over a long period of time. And when you think about it, it's um. It's again, it's somebody who's decided that they, they think they can help. That's what, that's what the McEntee family think. They think they can help me football to get better. And, um, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe people are just, they find it, first off, it's easier, you know. Although it's, not, it's not easy to send a letter to the house. Like it's actually, that takes it, time, effort. It's a pain and... in the hole to go and buy stamps. <laughs> yeah. like. A lot of effort to go and post that letter. But obviously, if the the whole family have come out now and are are, are tweeting about it, are, are writing about it, because it's got to that point where it it's got to a point that is it's probably unbearable at this point. And to see their dad go through this, I can't imagine. You know, it, it's just for someone who's gave up their time twenty four seven. Like I, I I can't understand it whatsoever. And yeah, it, it's it's really hard to understand it all. But well, it, the other thing is that it also makes it less likely that you're going to find a candidate who is capable of doing the job next time because the good candidates are going to be more likely than not be going. I don't really want this. Or certainly, I'm, so that's not to say that uh, good candidates won't put themselves forward. But mm-hmm. good candidates are definitely going to be thinking. I mean, look at the abuse that guy got, and he was like one of their own. Yeah, you know. Well, even what happened last year with if he was staying on as manager and it, there was all questions about that, you know, I definitely think that fed into the dressing room, fed into supporters, all of that stuff transpires onto the pitch and there's an added pressure then when you're going out and there was an added pressure for Andy. Well, it wasn't a unified county at that stage. No. At that, from that point on, there was a, a fissure in the whole thing. And, yeah. and we've seen in the past that very few counties can survive that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and th- that was massive at that point. So I think even from then, you know, he, he was fighting a losing battle, you know, and then obviously a lot of the results didn't go his way. And I think there's no one more disappointed than Andy and the players themselves. Oh, you no know? doubt, no doubt. Yeah, he always comes across as somebody who is uh, in, intensely involved emotionally in what's going on so therefore it clearly means a lot to him and as, as Anthony Moyes said yesterday great track record we'll come back to this a little bit because I know Paddy Andrews has been talking on the football pod about it and Tommy's coming up in a few minutes time the other big issue at the weekend then is the continuing fallout and it's in all the papers today um, Eddie Brennan is talking about his disappointment at the fact that whatever is going on between Cody and Shefflin is still going on despite the best efforts of the uh, RTE panel or particularly Jackie uh, at the weekend to oh it's all over now Grand now, it's finished. It's not finished and it's not over. Um, you were at the, the Leinster Hurling final and doing the post match interviews. What was the what was what actually happened? How did that all work? 
So basically first, um, when it co- obviously do TV and then you come into the, the room for the, the papers and then radio. So the, he goes in first, Brian did, to do the papers, chat and all of that with all those journalists and then he comes out to do some radio. So I was waiting for that section and he asked me my name again. I've interviewed him before, but he's like, again, what's your name again? I was like, Ashling. He's like, come off the ball. Okay, okay. And he, he basically we started the interview and at first I started, you know, about the game, of course. So I would talk about the game and how it went. Um, obviously, with a great performance by Kilkenny I, in terms of the results, not a great performance overall. You know, it was a bit dead atmosphere. I asked him all those questions, but in the back of my head, I was thinking, OK, there's one question I need to ask here. And then obviously I asked him then about Henry Shefflin. So I just said, look, I need to ask you about Henry Shefflin. Are we all reading into this too much? And he said, well, look, we, it's more about the players. So we, if straight away, he said, you know, it's about the players. And uh, all I know is that we were playing Galway tonight. So straight away for me, I said, OK, he's not even acknowledging Henry, you know, at all. He's straight away just putting it to the players. And he doesn't want to talk about it. He doesn't want to be the, the centre of attention. Fair enough. But for me, that said that there was definitely more to all of this. Um, and obviously we seen straight after he didn't go over to Henry Henry waited at the side of the sideline and Henry didn't move either there's a little bit of this where he's got a bit of a free pass do you know like normally at the end of a game you're, you're milling around and everybody moves towards each other it's kind of it's not like you know but there was a power move by Henry Sheffin as well to stand on the sideline he, yeah and wait I'm going to sit I'm going to stand here and wait because you know it's not my job to go over but actually you would tend to meet in the middle Mm. Wouldn't you? You normally both go towards each other. Uh, yeah, because you're out on the pitch afterwards. But there was a, a pronounced I'm standing here, which everybody's blaming Cody. I get it. I understand why they're doing that. But at the same time, and I made the point yesterday, we praised Brian Cody for being the most ruthless man in Gaelic games over two decades. And he didn't get to be ruthless by being nice to everybody, particularly those people who are now coming for him. And that's what Galway are coming for. They're coming for Kilkenny. If they lose that game, you've got Limerick and all Ireland. Semi final? No thanks. No thanks. I don't want that. I want the, I want Limerick in the Ireland final in the hope that there's a suspension or an injury or something. Of course, yeah. I want them at the last minute when all of a sudden the weight of history feels heavy on their shoulders. I don't want them in a the semi final. No. I, although I've already beaten them in the semi final. Does everybody does everybody forget that? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I just I think and so I, I can understand what's going on from Cody's perspective. And from Shefflin waited there and waited and waited and nothing happened. He's like, Okay, grand, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to blink. And he, he blinks first which is probably the bigger man in that instance. But he wasn't, there, there's a pair of the minute, I would say. I, I definitely feel like everybody is, it's like a 99% versus 1%. But it's closer to, it's closer to 60-40. Like, but how did it all start off? It started off from the very first handshake and what happened there? What uh, would you have said happened there? I would say uh, Cody was pissed off and, <laughs> and pulled him back and Shefflin was shocked. Yeah. But then he was uh, really shocked. He looked back. Is this happening? Like yeah. you know. But then, then there's a ball game on, and Henry Shefflin has never backed down from a fight in his life. <laughs> that's what made him the greatest hurler of all time, and that's why this story is so interesting. Yeah. Like, and we're, they we're, have battled so much together. The heights that they've reached together. And they shared the glory equally. Like they did share the glory equally. There's loads of scenarios where uh, a manager and a star player don't get the same levels of praise but Henry Shefflin is literally the greatest hurler of all time the mm-hmm. most successful the winningest and then Cody is now the, like considered the greatest hurling manager of all time and maybe the greatest hurling man of all time right so it wasn't like I don't I don't think either of them can be in any way jealous of the other uh, so that's not what it, it strikes me that that's not at the heart of this what's at the heart of this is competition yeah like, they are ridiculously competitive individuals, which has driven them on to the greatness that they've had so far. And now they, they see each other coming for each other's territory and that's why... But is it not leave it on the pitch sort of stuff? Like once the, oh, the whistle goes... That's not the that point of that. But once... How, well, do you leave, how, do you, how do you live a life? How do you live a life and then go, OK, that's over now? Very hard. But you have to have some level of, like, respect and... Oh, I'd say they respect each other deep down. They respect what each other's doing and they, they're tormenting each other. In a way. And that's why, like, it's like, uh, it's like the rumble in the jungle. <laughs> We've had two rounds. Yeah. We're not gonna get, I don't think we're going to get another round this year. It'd be a miracle if we did. Yeah. 
No, I, there, there's more to this. There really is. Even when they, they shook hands this time, so eventually they did, as you said, Henry walked over. What was said? Like, Henry is like he, he knew what way he was going to shake his hand to, the way he put out his hand and he grabbed the, the side of his hand. <laughs> um, I know. We're, we're, yeah. We can't have enough of this, by the way. Like, uh, if someone was to produce a six-part, 30-minute <laughs> uh, episode podcast series about the handshake I'd listen to the whole thing I would <laughs> they say oh we've had enough move on no we haven't what are you talking about it's the and I know a lot of people are saying talk about the game stop talking about this they're not though they and really people aren't people were tweeting me that after and I was like I have to ask that question no. I also well, want those, to those know those people are clowns I want to know like absolute clowns don't, <laughs> how do you not want to know don't talk about the interesting stuff whatever you do yeah like, what like, what surely I am going yeah. to ask about the biggest talking point because the game about- was the Crow really Park Seagulls who have been the uh, loudest voice of the <laughs> summer so far. 7.50 this morning OTB AM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. We're up next with Tommy Rooney. First, a passionate Paddy Andrews fumed about the state of me football in the latest episode of the Football Pod. The Football Pod in partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the GA Senior Football Championship. Check out the hashtag the toughest for more. I don't care about Beasley or Bonnet. If BJ wants to be successful you pull in the same direction. Look at what Offaly are doing. Look at what Rory Gallagher, Christian McKaig, all these guys at Berry said. That type of shit. They don't want this. County Board don't want this. The players don't want this. The supporters don't want this. You have got no chance. You can bring in Pep Guardiola next season. And if everyone's pulling in different directions, it's going to be the same story. Get used to Division 2. Get used to hiding off Dublin and Crow Park. First protocol, everyone is for the benefit of me, GAA. Clubs, supporters, sponsors, players because I don't care who you are you can be the world's greatest coach and you go in there if that's not a place forget about it templates are there and it can turn around quickly but if there's people going the other directions no, no one will want the job that would be my advice because that annoys me when there's self-sabotage within the county like are we not here to see me GA progress and be back to the boiling days and that type of thing we Dublin people want that the Leinster Championship needs that. And look, you can take a leaf out of Kildare's book, the bounce they've got, I, like, I don't think they're going to get through at the weekend, but bring in four of their greatest legends and all of a sudden the supporters are behind you, the sponsors are behind you, and I tell you, if you're a young player in there, you're behind the team as well. So it is a big appointment. It's massive. And you've got to be pulling in the same direction from the good start. Tommy, you look, you, look like you, were, um, you look like you were a school kid in front of the principal and the principal was a bit angry there. Yeah, no, that ha- definitely happened to me there, Jer. I was like a deer in the headlights. Yep. Uh, but that's what Paddy Andrews is like when he cares about something. And he clearly cares about the state of Mead football. They should get him in. <laughs> I know, imagine. That was the point I was trying to make. I was uh, trying to make the point that it can be tricky to get in an outside manager in a county like Mead. Banty, Seamus McEnany was the only one we had. That went very sour. We ended up in Division 3. Uh, the county board in March voted to get him out the clubs then went back on the county board disagreed very similar to what happened last October with Andy McEntee when oh right county I didn't realise the same thing exact same thing had happened yeah it's, it's happened three times during the last ten years where the Mead County Board have voted to do something and the clubs have said you're hang wrong on, hang on there now hang, yeah. on, hang on there now am I getting yeah. my tickets for the game they voted to keep Eamon O'Brien Mead, the club said good luck they voted to get rid of Banty the Mead Club said, you're staying mid-season. <laughs> they voted to get rid of McEntee wow. in October when mid-season ended in July. Wow. And the club said, you're staying. Now, if, if, if Mead had gotten rid of Andy McEntee last October, they were going to be one of 10 counties that were out of management ticket at that time. And I know, because we were joking on the football pod about where Andy Moran was going to go next. So there was 10 counties. There was nine counties at that time who still hadn't got a management team sorted. So we'd have been in a very, very, very tricky position. I didn't think there was any candidates ready to go last October I was very surprised but what was very clear was when McIntyre stayed on and he said he was going to go for it and the clubs voted him back in this was going to be the final year that it had it had probably reached the ceiling already in 21 that defeat to Kildare in the playoff to get back to Division 1 was the, the killer blow it was obvious where's the succession plan where is it like there's a little bit of work done Sure, with the minors and the under-20s over the last couple of years where John McCarthy and Carlo Brick have alternated. Um, and Carlo Brick's come into McCarthy's under-20 management team where he's supposed to this year. And they've got a bit of a plan going there, right? 
I would not be throwing Carlo Brick in at the minute. And at the minute, he's the only real internal candidate in Mead that people are talking about. I would not be throwing him in right now because the minors that he's been involved with are four years, five years away from being anywhere close to competing at inter-county football. And we know how difficult it is to get players through, regardless of whether they won in all Ireland when they were 17 years old or not. But surely so, we don't need to stay internal, Tommy. Well, I would think so, Ashton. But again, I don't know. You would think so what? Uh, I would think we don't. We need to go outside the county. Okay. I think that we need to have somebody coming in, freshen things up a little bit, change things up, um, and have that plan in place that when that very talented, we've had a very couple of very talented minor teams and a couple of talented under twenty teams that when they are big enough and old enough and strong enough that they're ready to move into Division One football. Not Division 2 football. We need to be playing Division 1 football consistently over the next couple of years. So, yeah, I'd be saying, go get someone. But I don't know who that is. Like, I've seen names thrown out there, Jer and Ashen, and I don't know. Have they just been made up? Have they been pulled out of the sky? Is it a bit like the Manchester United job when something comes up, the names just get thrown. Oh, we'd love this fella. And it grabs a bit of legs. So I don't know who's legit. But the noise in the county at the minute is that an outside manager is definitely a possibility. Yeah, like, oh, sorry, I wasn't saying there that internally that can't happen. Just the best person for the job. Mm. It shouldn't have to be internally. It, it, whoever the best person it is. If they are within me, just happy days. But it doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. You know, the best person should be the one that gets in there. Well, if the if the belief is that the management team over the, the minor and under 20 teams are going to get there eventually but they're not ready yet then give them another couple of years there and have them be your succession plan for whoever comes next give them a two to three year deal and hope that that works and so they even get even longer to hone their craft and see the throughput of, of young players uh, I don't know maybe succession plans are overrated in Gaelic games though it's not like it's a professional job where somebody will do a job for three or four years and then automatically go up like what, what Dublin did with uh, at the end of the Pacquiao era, when they had Pacquiao and Jim Gavin and Desi, like, and then that, like, this is our plan now for the next ten years. It turned out that's very unusual, and you could probably only do that if you have the throughput of players that they had, where everybody's like, "Well, this is a generational team. I'm going to stick around for it." Like, you know, it worked. It worked in Donegal with McGuinness. He had the twenty ones. He took the senior team. Um, I don't know whether that was by design or whether it was a succession plan but well bear in mind McGuinness, you know, it, McGuinness had three times been turned down for the under 21 job before yeah. that so like yeah. uh, again I'd say their uh, yeah, exceptions uh, approved the rule really yeah like people are, are, are excited about those minor teams and under 20 teams over the last couple of years I think it's a different situation at Hendrick County Management I just think it's different like it's nearly like running a I don't know, like a big business or something. It's absolutely huge. Like Ashton was talking there about it being 24-7 that you're committing to. And that's what Andy McIntyre did for six years. And it's an unbelievable commitment to do that at inter-county level. For a county with the expectation and the size, the the expectation, whatever, about how, how you know, poorly placed it is, the expectation and size of a county like Mead. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where you're going to get someone. Like, how far outside are you going to go? Are you going to get somebody from the bottom of the county, the country, in Kerry? I don't think so. Are you going to get someone from the top of the country? I highly doubt it. Um, so I don't know where Mead are going to turn to next. Dublin, obviously. <laughs> like, what do you mean, obviously? Who, Jared? I don't know. I, like, I, I don't know enough about the available coaching talent out there. And to be honest, mm. an individual coming and saying, I'm the man, no thanks. What I want is a backroom team. Here's my coach. Here's my strength and conditioning plan. Here's how I'm going to integrate with the, the clubs. Here's how I'm going to take a handover from Andy McEntee and his crew and a bit of continuity. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about me football to know, but certainly an individual coming in and saying, right, I'm the one messiah that's going to fix all this. That's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say we don't know who the candidates are yet. It'll be the clubs who'll be proposing them. And I would also add that there's a very good football review committee in place that I'd imagine will have an influence over who picks the next management team as well. And so the we, clubs will have a big say. Do we think the, the clubs will have a say? Do we think the, the clubs review committee will have a say? Do oh, sorry, okay. So the, the uh, and do you know is there like it, are the clubs the best people to be selecting for a start? Do they know enough about what's out there and what the bleeding edge of intercounty football management involves? I would I would say absolutely they shouldn't to be honest. Like I would say that the players should have as much say as the coach. Like the intercounty players there at the minute, the core players, the players that you want to keep, like Kyogen and Menton, um, who are 31 years of age now. And if Kyogen and Menton don't stay on, and I'll be honest, it was the first time I ever thought they looked human against Clare. 
and I think part of that is that it's natural in any team I think all the players in the day they just looked a couple of percent off it they mm-hmm. just did it just looked like people were waiting for the year to be over because they knew it was over that this project was over and I think it's fair to say that even when me got back at it in 20, early 2022 things just didn't look the same I do believe that the players should have a say as well. In other counties, Tommy, do we know if they, they've had a, a say in the past? Well, well, famously, in 2015 in Mayo, when uh, Noel Kennelly and Pat Holmes were, you could say, ousted after their All-Ireland semi-final defeat to Dublin, the Mayo players wanted to have representation on that executive. In club in club football, I know many clubs around the country. We did it this year. Won't yeah. Won't make a call without the players having a say because mm-hmm. the players know exactly what's needed. I, I'm not saying they should have ultimate say. Absolutely not. But I'm saying that if you've got something like the, a football review committee, where me have a number of very smart people operating um, at a developmental level in 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 Mead and looking at the wider picture, if you've got a county board who are in place, obviously the club should have a say. The players have to have a say as well. I think if you're if you've got an eight an eight team committee, two of them have to be players. Uh, John Claffey says Meath need to be more like Offaly and get back to basics and lose the sense of entitlement. Rommel, who's who's on who's on one this morning, says Meath fans want to get off their high horse and realise it's not the nineties anymore. They are spent and the fans delusional. Meath are the Blackburn Rovers of the GA world. He also goes on to say, hopefully Mayo Tom there so we can all watch Gilroy Squirm next week. Mm. Thanks, Rommel. And a happy good morning to you too. <laughs> good morning, Rommel. Yeah. Uh, like, he, he probably sleep. is right. Like, it definitely isn't the 90s anymore. But there is no reason why Mead football shouldn't be back in the mix and shouldn't be consistently performing at Division 1 level. And that is what they need. And I know Ashley made the point earlier about 2019. Between August 2019 and the end of the league campaign in 2020, Mead played more Division 1 teams than they'd played in the previous decade of football in league and championship. So in, in a space of, it would have been six months if the pandemic hadn't kicked in, but in the space of, I think, 15 months, they played more Division 1 teams. So the county haven't competed at that level for an awful long time. And when we were competing in that Division 1, those that, that year, that just 2019, like we were competing. The games yeah. were all seriously close. It came down to, I think it was Mayo was two, three points. Like they were all seriously close. So you can do it if you buy in and as a collective play together and I think that's what we haven't really seen the talent I feel is is there is just playing as one Uh, Danny Mack says Jim Gavin to be the next Mead manager Danny's having a laugh no chance yeah (laughs) but like Jim Gavin isn't Jim Gavin has completed the greatest feat that has to be completed in Gaelic football Jim Gavin has a young family I can't imagine Jim Jim Gavin has a, a career that he takes very seriously I can't imagine that Jim Gavin is going to give that up to save Mead football now in saying that you hear Paddy Andrews and how much he cares about getting Mead back that is the problem I got a lovely reception in Mayo last week as a Mead man oh yeah as Paddy opposed Andrew, to hatred yeah yeah is trying to you know get Mead back that Dublin football need them back that Leinster football need them back in Clare the last day all very amicable it's not a good place to be as a Mead <laughs> fan that people actually no we hated mind. you we, we hated you for decades because yeah. you just always beat us whereas now it's yeah. like ah <laughs> we can talk football again no problems exactly. you're not too exactly. bad <laughs> so we need to get back to that we need to be hated again uh, John Lynch says what have Offaly done Division 3 they've won one Leicester title in 40 years they haven't reached the Leicester final in over a decade Offaly have improved and rock bottom still below average I think the point is that it's clear well, actually what they have done is they've managed to get like a massive corporation involved in sponsorship mm-hmm. and they've uh, started the underage structures to be super competitive and they've got the supporters believing that they're going in the right direction and now maybe I'm, I'm going against myself here and that they do have a messianic figure but at administrative level as opposed to managerial level it just looks like they're putting structures in place to give everybody the best opportunity to succeed and you wouldn't say that um, that was always the case with uh, Meath um, that I'm not sure Andy McIntyre always had the, the structures behind him and the whole county behind him so uh, right um, some interesting games this weekend coming up mm-hmm yeah, there Mayo, are some very interesting games. Mayo heavy favourites uh, for they the game against favorites. against Kildare. And I can see why they're heavy favourites. They would have been heavy favourites for the game in Newbridge as well a couple of years ago. And they absolutely annihilated Kildare in the league. Like, it wasn't really a close game. There was a, a bit where I think maybe Kildare got it back to four points in the second half. And like, oh, but then nothing happened. You know, it, they didn't have anything to kick on. And Kildare conceded a massive amount in that game against... Mayo, they conceded a massive amount of the game against Westmead and as we all mm-hmm. know famously they uh, 
shooed five goals in in the first half against the Dubs. So, um, are we just going to see a very disappointing end to the first season of the Kildare Dream Team management, do you think? Or is there a kick in them? James O'Donoghue is adamant that there's a kick in Kildare this weekend. He is every, adamant. Every time he's predicted a good performance from Kildare, right down to the under-20s, he's been wrong. He is the <laughs> cold, clammy kiss of death with Jinx. his predictions. <laughs> that is very true. As I heard that, I was like, no, James, no, don't do don't it. it. Step away. It. No, stop. <laughs> I'll be honest. Usually the kiss to death comes when all three of us back the same team. But this, I, I just, I don't know. Glenn Ryan was in Castlebar. I don't know whether he got a tap on the shoulder of who may be coming up in the qualifier hat on Monday morning, but he made the right call out of four. Um, so that was a very good move from Glenn Ryan. Had a bit of good scouting mission. I'm not sure how worried he'd have been by Mayo, but at the same time, Jerry, you've made a list there of the games where Kildare have hemorrhaged a huge score. And defensively, they just haven't clicked. I think if this game was anywhere but Crow Park... Yeah. I'd be giving Kildare a bit more of a chance. I was just going to say that. Yeah, I think so, Ashley. Like, I think Croker suits Mayo down to the ground. I actually think Mayo were a lot better than the final scoreline against Monaghan suggests. I know Banty was saying they were robbed, possibly could have had a penalty, but Mayo shouldn't have been in that position. I think Mayo actually showed us that there's a lot more in them this year. They had a punch in the half-back line and McLaughlin, Durkin, Mullen driving forward, even in the Hessian. Henley was back in goals. He's worth three or four points on both sides, whether it's kickouts or frees. And I don't think they've, they've nailed it yet up front. But the one caveat, right? Uh, wasn't that wasn't the drawn game against Ross Common in Croker when they like true. needed needed a last kick to get through? So the whole notion that they're automatically good in Croker isn't actually true. They're automatically good in Croker when they're massive underdogs. Like after that game, obviously they came out and won the replay against Ross Common in the first ten minutes. I don't even remember. This is pre-COVID, isn't that 2019? Am I, am I right about that? No, 2018? it's 17. 17. 17. The year that, that long ago. by point. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like the the, the Mayo narrative uh, is grand, but Mayo kicking wide is also a narrative and they did a lot of that Big against time. Monaghan, you know? Yeah. The, the yeah. Disease... They just have a lot of experience there. When Kildare, yeah. yeah, they got that bit of experience the last day against Dublin because from the get-go and even watching them warm up, I felt they looked like the Crow Park factor. I was like, oh God, they look a little bit off here. And then they started the game and just even some of the, the shot selection, even different things like letting passes off. I was like, that was totally the wrong option. And it just looked like this is Crow Park having an impact on them. And it took them a little while to get into it. And they got into it, say, come the second half, but the game was over. Game was yeah. over. I, I think playing Dublin because they're so at home in Croker and they look so like yeah. chest out. They look like the real dubs in Croker. I think I think playing them in Croker, there's definitely an element of teams freezing a little bit. Both happened to both Mead and Kildare that they just start panicking once the dubs are swinging over 19 out of 20 shots. Um, the other thing about Mayo, Jer, is we talk about me being split and you know not pulling in the same direction. That county at the minute is definitely split. Like that, the county at the minute. We we had a roadshow, our first football pod roadshow in Castlebar last week. We had the first hour, which was all laughs and funny, and Keith Higgins and James and Paddy were in great form. The final 40 minutes, we did a bit of a match preview. I don't know whether the, the lights were turned on in the room, but it got very, very dark. Paddy Andrews threw it open to the floor at one stage. He said, and like I started panicking at this stage, he goes, What did you think? You know, should Mayo have taper off in the league or should they have gone for it? Or what was the story? And all you hear people shouting back is, It was shite. We're brutal. We're no, we've no chance. Do you know, it could have gone. I don't know what could have been said, but yeah. But if they if they whoop Kildare this weekend, they'll all be back in. Just when I thought I was out. It's I don't know. A, I think there's a lot of detractors in the county at the minute towards what's happening. And I think it's surprising given what James Horn has given them over the last, you know, decade, both ends of the decade. You know, how far he's brought them every single time, every single year. Hmm. You know, they, they have a lot to be thankful for in Mayo. A lot to be grateful for. They do. They do. They do. And they'll be always there. Pat Patronises the Mead man. Go, go man, Tommy. Oh, you guys, you have a lot to be grateful for. You could be me. It's true. It's true. Fair enough. Uh, I, the qualifier draw is really interesting because I think, um, so I, I think that there's a good chance uh, Mayo go through and there's a good chance that uh, the winners of Donegal Armagh are going to come through that battle hardened. But uh, Cork versus Limerick and Roscommon versus Clare, like the provincial champions will all be happy enough to be drawn against the winners of Roscommon Clare or Cork Limerick in particular. Like this, yeah, definitely. Isn't there a chance that Dublin reach an All-Ireland uh, semi-final this year? Like, there's a 50-50 chance where the hardest game that I've played is Ross Common, maybe? 
Yeah, hundred percent. I think Kerry could be, possibly be in the same boat. They've gone a long time now without a game. Obviously, you're relying on internal matches. I'm not convinced either of those teams, either of those 35 players, are as competitive as it may have been four or five years ago. You're relying on that um, over the next four weeks. There's no one you can play challenges against. Anyone who's still in the mix can't play them. You might come up against them in a few weeks, and every other county is knocked out. So, I think it'll be difficult for those counties to get up to the level that they're going to need to face each other in Crow Park. On July 10th, I think that All Ireland semi final is going to be if they get there. So, yeah, Donegal and Armagh, how do you see that going, Jared? Because Donegal were very impressive against Armagh. Ethan Rafferty stood out at the weekend, probably played the Rory Began role better than Rory Began's ever played it. But uh, Ethan Armagh Rafferty were very impressive massive... against Tyrone, you mean? Yeah, but Donegal were very impressive against Armagh. It's seven weeks they... ago. Yeah. So, I don't know, how do you, how do you think that game is going to go? I think that um, you'd have to give Armagh. The sense that we're, they, we're a team of confidence. We've mm-hmm. we've discovered some stuff. We've thrown off the shackles of fear that we had in that first game, which was actually more of an aberration. So if you if you think about Armagh's season, the mm-hmm. final two games of the league where they're tapering off, getting ready for the championship, they obviously tapered off too much. Came out, were a bit shook, and have recovered the early season form and made some changes, and are now that rolling ball of knives that McGinley loves so much in the back door and the qualifiers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think, think that role different. as well of Ethan, as you've mentioned, is really standing to them. Because even see when he's warming up before the game, like he does these like sprints out, mm. like he it's as if he's he's warming up, like he's a corner forward. You know, he's sprinting out with the ball, and he's completely a free man. Then you know, and they they're looking around to what do you do? Do you go to him? Do you leave your player? And he's going straight up the field and scoring. So it's a it's brilliant for them. It's a new aspect to play, and like this is first year, isn't it? That he's well, he only got put into goals, I believe, in the middle of the league this year, and it definitely was a wild card move from McGinney, and you can see the benefits of it the last day, Ashley. But do you remember? Could you? I can picture it right now. The full court Donegal press that they put on. Um, you could see it on the BBC cameras. I think you might have been at that game, Donegal Armagh, but like the full press that they put on, Rafferty couldn't get out. He couldn't get out. And Donegal, yeah. only for their shooting was so wayward in that first half, should have been out of sight. Armagh came out and for seven or eight minutes, Armagh are sensational in that game. It's the Armagh we know. They're playing with chaos, with abandon. But they leave 2-2 behind them. They don't score. Donegal break. And I think McBurty gets his goal and they get two points and the game is over. They get 1-2. So that's where that game was won. But Rafferty was destroyed on the kickouts that day. Like that, that I would have thought would have left scar. Um, he's come through it he was very impressive last weekend but Donegal who didn't put a, apply this press to Derry Zorn Lynch need to be applying this press if they're going to beat them this weekend and I think I don't, I don't know how our man do we think they'll it. set up a little bit differently than how they Donegal, would have set yeah I don't think they can I, I, I think that's the, I think that's the problem at the minute I think Donegal have the players I just think the system that they've been playing for the last little while the way they've been building up I think we've just been let down so many times by Donegal I just I find it very difficult to back them again uh, okay, um, what about Clare as a as a Clare man now, Tommy? Yeah, I had my half and half jersey on Cusick Park the last time. <laughs> um, at least I can fully wear my Clare jersey now. I actually can't. I'm half Roscommon more so. My mom's from Roscommon. Uh, how's this game going to go? Um, I think Roscommon are going to love Croker. I think they've. I know they have a record there where they've they've struggled to win big championship matches in Croker since the eighties. But they'll remember the league final more than that, you know. Yeah, exactly. And they shot the lights out that day, even though they conceded a bucket load of scores. I think they have the footballers that it'll, it'll suit them in Croker. I think they possibly, they probably should have caught Galway if they mixed it up a little bit more a little earlier. thought Ulton Herney had a massive game that day. Their forwards were pretty quiet. I think Clare will be stronger in the middle. They're shooting, let them down the last day. Big time against Mead. They should have beat Mead by 15, 20 points. Like, legitimately. The Mead goalkeeper, Harry Hogan, made three exceptional saves. Stopped a penalty as well, so it's four. And Clare kicked a lot of wides and the game is in a melting pot. So if Clare gets their shooting on, uh, this game would be very, very tight. I would be but so much more excited for these games if they weren't in Crow Park. A though. thousand percent. A thousand percent. Yeah. I do wonder if it's a joke. all the counties shouldn't just come up with a home and away arrangement and go, look, at some point we're going to meet you in a championship match. It's home and away. Away we go. Yeah. Like and, and just like take the decision out of because it's funny the decision about uh, Martin Brownie's giving out about it today. Uh, Is he about giving the, out about Crow Park? Uh, giving out about the home and away um, oh, for of course he is. Uh, for that for the Limerick Cork game being in Porky Cueve. Um, I've never read somebody to be so consistently against 
everything I believe in the GA Martin Bretney <laughs> as always every single column is like the complete opposite of what I think um, anyway his point is that the, the home and away should actually only apply for the provincial championships and it shouldn't apply for and it, that, that should be at a neutral venue and actually in, in this case Tony I'm not sure I disagree to be honest because uh, Cork are saying no no you owe us because we played you last and so that ah, came okay. to Cork Creek yeah. um, so like I, I do wonder if um I do wonder if, if actually the home and away isn't a bad idea. In this instance, you might get more Porky Creeve than you would if that game was being played somewhere else. Maybe they could have played in Killarney. I don't know. Would that have got... Mm-hmm. I don't know. The price of hotel rooms in Killarney is probably the same as it is in Dublin at the moment. I don't know. Um, yeah. But look, the Crow Stick Park issue... Stick it in Ennis. You could have stuck it in Ennis, out. yeah. Have an atmosphere. You know, the Kerry Limerick Hurling game was packed out in Ennis. It was brilliant. I think there was possibly four and a half five thousand at that game and against me and it was a good, very good atmosphere you know um, Tommy, I don't know I, before, just a waste. before we go uh, you were uh, another full competitor at the triathlon at the weekend you finished well done, two minutes ahead of, of Ashley but I'm not sure you actually finished two minutes ahead of her according to the times yeah we think it's one so or maybe I one bet minute. you well, she, was, well, she was laid into the water because of the, the uh, wetsuit issue. But your time and chip doesn't, your time doesn't start until you... But I had no water. time and chip. That's the thing. She had no time and chip. But I lost fell my time and chip for two minutes on the bike. And I spent two Tommy, minutes... Tommy, I the definitely bet you. Gilroy comes beside me and says, keep going. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've just been in the dish for two minutes. Did you, no, you got off I, the bike? I had a number. I had to get off the bike for two minutes looking for my time and chip. I had a number of equipment issues. No. Okay. Forgot my shoes. But I also realised later... That I wore my bloody wetsuit inside that. Oh, we, we, we knew that. <laughs> yeah. Why no, the tell? pictures we put up, actually, that's how I could spot you in the water because the tag on the back of it was hanging out. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? I'm not. This it added my to thing it all, back. Tommy. Uh, a bad workman it. blames his tools, Tommy. That's one of the first little adages yeah. you learn as a, as a young Irish lad. A bad workman was, blames his tools. I was just very happy to get through it. No injuries. Very, very enjoyable. Even just to finish it, I thought it was brilliant. No, I no, no. Well you were competing against Shane through. and then he absolutely destroyed you and now it's like, oh, I was ah. just happy I was just happy to take part. That was that was my ambition the whole time. Shane Hannon is built for that type of sport. Look yeah. at him. He just like he just flew through it like. You know, so well done to Shane. But, you know, if I met Shane in the corner of a football field, I'd be pretty confident I'd be winning that ball. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> that, that's not what happened though. It was a triathlon. No. You weren't playing no. full forward. It's grand. So it's very true. Right, very we'll, sure. we'll yeah. see you out there next year. Tommy, good yeah, stuff. Definitely. The well uh, roadshow is available for watch. Full full thing is up on YouTube right now. Up on YouTube, yeah. The first hour, plenty of laughs, plenty of stories. Check it out. And uh, this week's episode of Football Pod is available in the Football Pod feed on podcast. We'll have it ready to go every Tuesday morning at the very latest. If we get recorded earlier, we'll have it up on a Monday night. All right, good stuff. After the break, we're live in studio with Cork Sarah Donovan. First, here's Tommy Walsh and last night's Off the Ball with Willow Callahan saying that the Munster final between Clare and Limerick was the best game he's ever seen in the flesh. Back after this. We were kind of throwing it about in the hurling pod with James Scale and with Paul Murphy this week and we're thinking, has there been a better Munster final like in recent memory when you take everything into account the difficult conditions the huge crowd that were packed in you know, the game sells out in 11 minutes so there was all the expectation and hype and the fact that they had the drawn game a few weeks ago and it lived up to all of that I think like just the intensity of the game the fact there was no space to be had whatsoever like I would think if you're a player Tommy you probably relish days like that where you were tested to your absolute maximum before you come off the pitch yeah well um, I'd say I agree with you in the fact that I'd say looking at a game anyway it's the best game that I've ever been at and watching because it had everything. Some games are part of the game, whether it's high scoring or high physicality. Some games have the high intensity. This game had absolutely everything with it. Um, like it was a month, there was a Munster championship there to be won. You had two border, border counties. You had Limerick versus Clare. You had the Mick Mackey Cup for the first time. The crowds, like I was there very early, but there was about an hour or two before the game. The, the, the PA announcer was shouting, can, can the people please go up to their seats? So it was very wet down there. So they're obviously all huddling underneath the stand back out in the tunnels. But there was such a crowd coming in, I would I, I, I guess at the time that they wanted them all up into their seats for safety. Right? This is what they're dealing with. The, the town end, the climb end, both of them were full early, early in the day. And like I think who deserves huge credit, Will, in, in I suppose... Making making it a great day is the referee John Keenan. Yeah. Because there could have been a thousand frees win. But he didn't because there was no real dirt. There was it was everyone going for the ball. And sometimes when there's such 
huge intensity and physicality in a wet day. But listen, there can be technical fouls as such. But no, he let go and let the best team win. And, you know, I don't think anyone can complain there was any dirt in the game. I thought I was played in the highest of spirits. So, like, if you look at the, the scoring side of it, you had Seamus Flanagan scoring eight points from play. You had Tony Kelly scoring seven. Davy Fitzgerald, five. You had um, Ryan Taylor scoring three. Just tr- Aaron Galan, a top day, but finishing with three from play. So on the sc- and Gerard Egerty's goal, you know, one of the goals of the ages. On the defensive side of it then, you had Will O'Donnell. Like, who puts him out over the line? Like, the, I don't know which player guy he was, but he absolutely tunneled him outside the line. You know, and you never see that with any Limerick guys. You see in Tony Kelly getting hooked out in the line. I saw Ryan Taylor getting shoved out over the line. All in the proper way, you know, man to man, shoulder to shoulder. So it had everything. And then you had, I suppose, the bragging rights were on the line. And that was, you know, Clare versus Limerick. Clare would have liked to come in, I'd say, and win the McMackie Cup. They were trying to win the first month or since 1998. Um, like a lot of these players, Tony Kelly, David McInerney, um, you know, John Connolly, all these guys, they've, they've league titles, they have all Ireland titles, but they've no Munster championship, you know. And we all know the guys in Munster, you're from off the end from Kilkenny, but we hear about from the Munster counties all the time, Will. They love the Munster Championship. They take great pride in the Munster final and win the Munster Championship medal. So that was on the line for the Clare guys. So with so much on the line and so many great performances, I think always a sign of a great match is you could pick out seven or eight guys that were a man of the match. You know. So listen, you're you're a hundred percent right. It was a game for the age as well. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Yeah. Sean has muted himself, I think. I'm not sure what's going on there. Paul, come on, you come in. You can uh, finish the job from another Bulls fan. Are you standing beside Sean? Yeah, yeah, we're all on the spot. Ah, right. <laughs> we're, not, we're not one bit happy. That's 50 of us on this Bulls are not one bit happy. For immediate reaction from around the grounds, catch League of Ireland late night. Every Friday, 10 p.m. on Twitter Spaces. Follow at Off The Ball. Things that put people off on a first date. Showing up late and getting your name wrong? Always a great start. Looking at their phone more than you? Eh, uh, hello? Someone who only talks about themselves? Oh, really? God, aren't you great? Look, no one said dating is perfect, but at godating.ie, we promise we'll always try and find your perfect match. And if you sign up today, you'll get one week on godating.ie absolutely free. Yes, even you, socks and sandals guy. Go on, go for it with godating.ie. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Okay, Sarah Donovan is with us. Sarah, you were listening to uh, Tommy Walsh saying this was the best game he has watched in the flesh. Obviously, he's been part of some games himself, which would stand comparison with the Munster Hurling final, but not far off it. I agree with them. It was an incredible spectacle from the get go. The noise going around the pitch the players stayed behind the band for the the walk beforehand and as it went through the stands and into the terraces the flares the noise like I was getting nervous I'm thinking about it now and I'm getting nervous it was crazy absolutely crazy and then the game didn't disappoint it actually it it seemed to start late as well because uh, the referee had to blow for them to get into the parade a couple of times which was unusual enough but then obviously because sometimes one team breaks away and they're not going to be a part of it and blah 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 it's like all and, but actually no this was it was real ratcheting head, up the tension like real heads up they were all walking like soldiers around the pitch nobody left it was absolute concentration the game doesn't start till about 4.03 or 4.04 because of that and as soon as the ball was thrown in it just went nuts yeah um, did we learn anything about the two teams other than they are the best two teams and hopefully we're entering a golden age of a new rivalry that will inspire the whole country again? I, the intensity that Clare had in the first half, Limerick, slightly struggled to match even though they were level se- six or seven times, right? It, the midfield for Clare, Ryan Taylor, um, I thought he was exceptional in the first half. There's a bit of a frustration, I'd say, for Willow Donoghue and Darrow Donovan because Declan Hannan sits, Tony Kelly can rove they've got to pick up three players and they looked like they weren't marking anyone. Now, they obviously got into it later on and Willow Dunn who got that great late score, but it really looked like Limerick's midfield didn't have answers for the Clare midfield and I think that's because the three in the middle was causing them such problems. So that's probably what we learnt about the game was that put in a third midfielder and Limerick struggle. They don't look as dominant. 
if that third midfielder is a generational talent. Do you know what I mean? It's like, a, it, and, and maybe that's the other side of this is that actually what Claire can do is unique to Claire, and so everybody else needs to come up with their own issues. Um, but there, there definitely seemed to be part of it where Limerick were unlimerick like uh, when Great. they were missing, they were they were hitting wides, which we don't see. Dermot Burns was off colour, you know, and I suppose that's another thing. In a couple of weeks, he'll now have four weeks to sit back. Hit the black spot for four weeks. I don't think he will be as inefficient in four weeks' time. So there's another layer to Limerick. And, and what was that? What what happened in that? Like what put them off their game? I, I can't say they were off their game. I just think that the occasion, you know, was was a massive occasion, and they they were workmen. Like let's this is their fourth title in a row. Like not everything is going to go right all of the time, and they still won. And that's the sign of champions. But mm. there's another level in Limerick when you consider it, they missed so much and especially Dermot Burns or, or is it that Claire put them off is it that whatever Claire are doing that there's actually something that they haven't seen over that period of time when they've generally been able to swat teams away I think it's down to the referee as well there was a lot that he let go and there was things that were unseen off camera that in other games wouldn't have been let go and there was yellow cards that didn't happen and if I'm being honest Conor Cleary if he was on a yellow card earlier in the game so I think, I think it was 60-65 minutes before he got the yellow card and w- as soon as he got the yellow card because he was hugging Aaron Galan for 60 minutes right as soon as he got the yellow card Aaron Galan gets two points off the bat because he had to step off because he was in danger of being yeah. sent off so if those things had happened earlier in the game those yellow cards had been given earlier in the game Limerick wouldn't have I suppose been given, I suppose, so little leeway or yeah. room. Unless unless you do what, um, you know, the uh, football teams do, which is foul, get your yellow card, move on. Somebody else comes, fouls, gets his yellow card, moves on. Well, the rotational yellow cards that we would have seen that would have been pioneered by the great teams. Kilkenny. Um, excellent at it. Now, I won't say Limerick weren't Saints by any means. Like Shane O'Donnell caught an incredibly frustrated figure because two or three times he broke... He was pulled back and he's like remonstrating with the referee saying, be a card, let's yeah. go. Well, like, what's yeah. going on here? Why aren't I getting my card? So it was tit for tat. But from the referee's point of view, we enjoyed the game immensely. But from Limerick's point of view, there was definitely areas where they would normally have more room. We we kind of are already talking about the trilogy and what's going to happen when they meet again in Croke Park. But there's a lot to go in between now and then. And the recuperation from the letdown of the absolute high of Tony Kelly's equaliser to the end of the game from Clare how they manage that now is going to be the hardest part of management Uh, the best interview that I read over the weekend afterwards was probably Brian Cody's interview because he said we have four weeks now to sit back get into training we haven't had an opportunity to do what we have wanted to do because the games have been coming so thick and fast we get to now watch the Clares the Wexfords the Corks and see what comes through and as you said Clare now have to Get over Exford. I, I can't see Wexford losing to Kerry and if they do, they don't belong in the championship. But Wexford are capable of beating big teams. If three years ago, Wexford could have beaten Tip and could have been All-Ireland champions. You know, Wexford went out three weeks ago, beat Kilkenny against the odds and Kilkenny are three in a row Leinster champions this week. So Wexford shouldn't be written off You just at this never point. know at Wexford. No. They're so hot and cold. Absolutely. So inconsistent, but then they put up this massive performance. But they have a punch. They have attacking, you know, they've, they've very good attacking forwards. They have Rory O'Connor, Conor MacDonald, uh, obviously Lee Chin. Like, they have capability to, to win games. Yeah. So they can't be discounted. Um, and that's the challenge for Claire to get back up to the emotional pitch um, and the physical pitch. And in fairness, it's not next week, so there's enough time for the bodies to recover, you would suspect. Just two weeks, but I just feel that they can't even focus on Limerick now. They, they nearly have to forget that that whole championship and, and see this All-Ireland Championship as a completely new championship. To be able to bring yourself to a performance level that's going to guarantee you a win over Wexford. If they get over Wexford, there's nothing that they're scared of to stop them like they're presumably not looking at that Kilkenny team going oh that's terrible we have to play Kilkenny it's like yeah bring it on yeah but Kilkenny have learnt a lot again and like the basics Kilkenny get right every time so the fielding Kilkenny's fielding the last night was exceptional in Croke Park uh, TJ Reid lads I, I can't explain like every time I looked up he was plucking a ball out of the sky yeah. and that wasn't just him Mikey Butler laid on this ridiculous like catch out of the sky so they do the basics so, so well. They're so, so physical. They don't allow team space. They'll enjoy playing Clare if they do get to play Clare. 
Um, you were on Tony Kelly. We'll talk about the the uh, Lancer file because, as you said, you were at it uh, in a moment. But um, you were on Tony Kelly's side. You had a perfect view. And my companion next to me was going, "He can't take it. He can't. Like he he can't be so selfish to try and do this right now." Ball goes square between the posts, and she goes, "Holy Jesus!" He was so calm. Absolutely. He just walked up calm as you like, and I was like, he, "He's not even taking time here." He just, there was no fear, no panic, no pressure. There was pressure. a split second where both of us went, he surely can't try this. Like, he surely should go for the short ball. He's not going to be so selfish here to take this decision well, for the team. he backed himself Absolutely. the whole way. And it was just, we were so surprised for, for him to do that in that instant. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, it was incredible. M- massive bravery there to yeah. do that. But a, a stunning, stunning score. Uh, does that make him hurt of the year? Is it like very hard for anybody else to get that? Or like are there several of those Limerick lads are going, hang on a second now, hang on, we won the game. By the way, folks, does everybody remember we won the game? Um, I'm I'm with I'm with Tony on this one. And I've probably been with him for about five weeks now. Like the, the hook on Garrett Hagerty early on, the the pick, and then he just makes this space. It was like three or four or five yards of space and he was gone. Like oh, that's for the point. Yeah. See, absolutely the, the stunning. Po- the the, the uh, sideline is getting rightly all of the praise but that point is kind of Michael Donlan-esque yeah it's, it's at that level it was one of, of the best scores we've seen this year and this is what I'm saying about the frustration that he's caused Will O'Donoghue and Darren O'Do- or Darrow O'Donovan because he's you can't mark him or pick him up because he's he's so his intensity is incredible so the other X factor in all this is and the, the point you're making about the midfield being a little bit overrun is that they don't have Keen Lynch in there at the moment who's being their third body who's coming in and causing the same difficulties for the opposition so if they do meet again it's going to be a different Limerick team. Yeah, like Cahill O'Neill scored two points but he doesn't have that same I suppose he's not as just as much of a distraction as Keen Lynch is because Keen and Tonally are cut from the same cloth so you're right there is another level to Limerick and that's why as excited as we can be right now about opposition we're just thinking about him coming back in and Peter Casey as well yeah and yeah, yeah. Peter Casey yeah absolutely so on the other side of the draw um, what have you seen at this point from Galway let's let's talk about the, the Leinster hurling final because um you know, Galway were many people's favourites for that game on the basis of what had happened and the fact they were coming forth and how flaky Kilkenny were at home against Wexford. To be honest, I, I kind of wrote the Wexford game off because, like, barring a miraculous series of results, they were clearly already through. Like, I know everybody says there was an opportunity, but there wasn't really. Like, Dublin had done nothing all year to suggest that they were going to be able to recover. So, um, champions don't lose games like the Wexford game and that's why I suppose we were saying that Kilkenny was so, so flaky but I genuinely thought Galway had more in them I was so disappointed with Galway and my frustration and I, Henry Shefflin's frustration they they panned to him a lot on the sideline like they were looking for lots of reaction so we, we got a lot of Henry on the big screen in Croke Park the frustration on his face for the majority of the game and the exasperation. I'm If I was a player in the middle of that field looking out at him, I'd be nervous. And I felt that Galway played like nervous kittens for 60, 70 minutes, you yeah. know? And I, and I wonder, does Henry Shefflin's demeanour on the sideline need to change? Because if he looks stressed and panicked, then that's going to play onto the field. So certainly for the Galway, the, potentially the Cork game, right? Because my worst fear has come through and... Uh, a very sad and sorry goal we are now going to be potentially playing Cork in two weeks time with a point to prove and are Cork going to be ready for Galway that's I suppose the, the thing that's coming down the track for Cork but I, I certainly think Henry Shefflin needs possibly to tape it down on the sideline because it's he, I, that's what he said after the game that the most disappointing part of it all was that they just didn't perform whatsoever you know to, and I think walking away from a pitch knowing we just didn't even show up no you know punch. not at all yeah you know, that was probably one of the, the biggest things. But I was watching their warm-ups. I don't know if you've seen their warm-ups before the game. And watching the two warm-ups, I was so impressed with, with Galway's. You know, they, they were doing a lot of first stuff touch, like one-two, like uh, getting in pairs and running off the shoulder. And it was very in, in, intense. When I was looking down at Kilkenny, I was like, geez, it doesn't seem as intense. So I was like, OK, they're going to start now, like, you know, full throttle. And it was complete opposite. Well, I was uh, training. I coached a team with the Kilkenny man. 
and we were doing the session last night and he was in Croke Park Saturday night as well. He was taking notes. So he had looked at the Kilkenny warm up and he, say, he said, Sarah, it's never impressed me. And he said, but I, there was a great drill the, the Galway lads were doing. So he'd set up a Y in front of the goal. So I had the girls doing it last night. Yeah, they had some great see, drills. Yeah, you could see they were they were hopping. The girls were hopping after the and session. And what you want to do before a game. Getting your touch in when I was looking Getting down. Touch. Yeah. Uh, like, so mm. I was surprised they couldn't get going then. Really, but, really positive. Yeah, so I, the, the, but why did not work then? What, what? Yeah. <laughs> but Laz, Kilkenny's, uh, like, the way they can ca- handle a game and handle the intensity of a game and just bother lads. Like, they were, they bothered Galway so much that Galway started pulling out of tackles. They were off. Their tackling was too high. The, it was quite stop start. It was, like, it was a poor game in terms of the amount of freeze. Like, TJ Reid scored 12 points from freeze. Yeah. But outside of that, Kilkenny did the basics well. And Galway didn't. So and a lot didn't go Galway's way as well. But it you seemed. make your own look. Like the game's think, refereed differently. The game was refereed poorly, to to my mind. Like because it, there was an opportunity to allow some things go, and he was so on the money. I wasn't two minds about that. Like his, your point about Galan, right? Like mm. uh, is Galan being wrestled illegally for fifty minutes, fifty five minutes, actually good for the game, or? Do you know what I mean? But the the umpires are responsible for Gillan's uh, position, right? But things that happen out in the middle of the pitch where a lad takes too many steps or, or, or he's perceived to be too strong in a tackle, you can allow that stuff go. But allowing a lad to be wrestled for 60 minutes, that's the umpire's job. To, and to and here's the, the thing, if, if, if the referee had blown for all of that, then... Galan would have had 12 points from freeze mm-hmm. and we would have said he had a great game. Do you know? Like... I, I, and, and maybe that stops the next game. I don't know. But how long? How long does was, Connor Cleary get? Connor Cleary got Connor Cleary got too long. If there's a consistency between the two occasions, then uh, maybe the match on Saturday looks completely different, and maybe the results the same. I don't know. I, I just it's so hard to know what the right thing to do here is. How do you condition players to expect not to foul, or you'll get punished for fouling? So I think that Saturday's game was absent a few goals, right? And that it would have definitely changed the, the makeup of the game. And as, as it got, it, it was dour, right? The referee didn't help it. But I, I agree with you. you. Like players are, it's, it's hard to know where, where to draw the line. Well, is it going to be completely different now that we're in the All-Ireland series and they're like, Asher, look, all that stuff is over. New, new set of rules, lads, have at it. <laughs> Which is basically what happened, right? I'd love to say that the game on Saturday night could have been a better game if there was a better flow to it. But I don't know if Galway were ready for it mentally, right? So uh, I think that the Clare and Limerick game was always going to be a better spectacle, but Keenan added to it. But coming away from the Galway Kilkenny game, a lot of people were, were, were saying to each other, going down for the interviews, just never got going. Stop, start, stop, start. But those Unenjoyable. three early chances that Owen Murphy, you know, obviously saved. I th- yeah, I think true. You, like the game before, it had nine goals, fifty-five mm-hmm. points. Right, it was a rip-roaring affair. It was too loose, you know, and that's why I would say Cork, when they go to Antrim uh, on Saturday, need to get their work done in the first half, get in and get out. That's a ten-hour round trip to Antrim for Cork, and then they have to go out the following week and play Galway. Not fly up, no. Uh, where would they land? <laughs> Two airports in Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> so are they going to do a private jet? Well, they, with Cork's money are Sports Direct going to pay for this I mean, who knows I mean they have plenty <laughs> they're, they're financially bankrupt lads they're, they're not, not they're not they're not financially bankrupt they, they have managed their, they've I managed to cut their deal have. so anyway um, uh, so let's go back to uh, the Galway recovery then how, how easy is it for them to recover when you got so when you've got so much wrong over the course of 70 minutes there's a lot to unpack so I would not be afraid for Galway about the improvements that they're going to be able to make over the next four, like two weeks. They had no punch in their attack. Mm. Uh, outside of Conor Whelan, there was nothing yeah. happening. Mm. Now, as I said, the likes of Conor Cooney and Joseph Cooney, very unfortunate, you know, because they could have had goal chances early on. Could have been a very different game. So certainly from their point of view, loads to learn, loads of improvements to make. Henry's uh, demeanour on the sideline, if that changes and the boys feel a little, little less nervous... You know, I, I think it's going to be a much bigger game and I'd be worried for Cork because of the reaction that Galway are going to have to bring. And on that side of the draw, if everything goes the way we think it is, we're probably going to have, we should have a, on form, you would expect that it might be a Limerick-Galway semi. Yes. No, it would be, oh, well, 
I'm not going to write off Cork yet. I was listening to the lads. Nobody's writing off anyone. Tommy keeps going for Kilkenny. I'm the only one who seemed to be going against my own. But I just can't discount this Galway team. So yeah, you're right. And if that happens, uh, is there, because they'll be massive underdogs at that point. But we've always thought that they had the physicality to match. I don't know if they still do. But... Um, Without know. Joe Canning, um, I don't know if Galway's attack is as potent as it was in 2017, 2018, 2019 when they were actual contenders against Limerick. All right. Uh, so at this stage, Limerick in your power rankings, number one, Clare two, Kilkenny three? Yes. Is it close between Kilkenny and Clare? Yes, but Kilkenny are physically bigger men than Clare. Clare are short men. Like they're incredibly fast and efficient, but they're short. Uh, Garo Taker, he was running through the last year, it looked like there was three lads running off his hips. Like they're short men. So that Kilkenny team have that that height and physicality over Clare, which could be the difference. All right, Sarah, good stuff. Thanks very much for that. It's 8.40 this morning, OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Sports page is up next. First, here's Republic of Ireland defender Shane Duffy talking about his future with Brighton ahead of Ireland's Nations League match against Ukraine tonight. With David Myler talking about this in about 20 minutes' time. Stay tuned. Um, yeah, I haven't played a lot, so it's been a couple of things. I've, I've had a few niggles um, from, from March, and um, another thing is I couldn't, I couldn't get into a team that was playing so well, and a team that finished ninth in the Premier League, the highest position in the club's history, so uh, I had to play my part around the place with the team and, and sort of use my experience with helping people around and, and getting us over the line. But um, Difficult not playing every week, every footballer will tell you that, so uh, just got to keep my head down and, and keep going. So, and, and on the future, um, I'm not really focused so much yet. I've got three three more huge games for my country to, to try and focus on, and that's what I'm, what I'm fully focused on. So um, I think I'll sit down with the club after this camp, and I know I need to be playing regular to, to be involved, to play for my country, which is probably a massive the biggest thing for me to be to be available and playing my best football for Ireland. So um, I know I need to be playing football every week. So uh, as I said, these three games and then I'll sit down with the club and, and we'll, we'll figure out which is the best option for us if, if um, it's going forward. There are so many idiots out there, so many spoofers. There's a lot of horse. I think he's a total spoofer. What do you mean, a spoofer? He says bullshit. Ah, no, I haven't. Come on, don't be, don't be, no, I'm not. Yes. No. 8.41 this morning, we can uh, talk you through some of the newspapers, the Irish Times, pressure growing on Kenny as Ireland faced tricky assignments. Um, Ukrainians relay harrowing truth of what is happening at home. I mean, really talking about the football tonight seems kind of churlish when uh, Ukraine are representing a country that has been invaded by Russia. Uh, new monster regime should prioritise a performance template over trophies. It's, um, we talked with Matt Williams about what, what needs to happen but uh, we're also going to talk about the, the URC uh, Seamus Coleman our captain on the front of the Indo this morning in the back of the Indo we're alive and we're still fighting Ukraine motivated to do nation proud in Dublin and keep country in the headlines Cody Sheffield saga is a sad sight to see for Kilkenny says Eddie Brennan who is doing media uh, Graham McDowell I'm proud to take part in Saudi rebel tour GMAC proud of Saudi tour is the headline on the back of the Daily Star uh, where's the one that I'm looking for here the mirror they don't have it Johnson quits PGA for Saudi but wants Ryder Cup is the back of the mirror and the sun GMAC I live for cash that's what that's the headline of Martin Lipton's piece which I think has caught the tone more accurately than the other headlines Gray McDowell admitted he joined the Saudi backed live golf tour for the cash and in an added bonus for the PGA Tour Rebels, they have been given the green light to play in next week's US Open. So, GMAC says, The financial side of the sport always weighs into the schedule. We've played all around the world for 20 years, chasing paychecks. It's a business. Yes, we love the sport. We love competing. But it's a purse we're playing for any given week. Appearance money. We're, the royal we, are running a business here. So, that's GMAC. It, uh, it all came out yesterday in the press conference that he's in it for the money. And there's lots of Saudi money to go around. Um, so Emma Raducanu is also injured. That's the lead story in the Telegraph. 
She got injured yesterday in the preparation tournament and probably looks like a significant doubt for Wimbledon. Uh, Harry Kane scored his 50th goal for England last night from the penalty spot against Germany. And uh, that is really... Seize the day. Kenny called on Ireland to show winning spirit. And there's a headline in the back of the Irish Daily Mail. Just admit it's about the wedge, Graham. And it ain't the sand wedge that they're talking about. Uh, please, McDowell and Co., just admit it's all about the wedge. This is a, a comment from their chief sports writer, uh, Riyad Al Samari. It's true. Now, Tiger Woods turned down the live money, but he's also not playing in the US Open because he's playing at the JP McManus uh, Invitational, which has obviously nothing to do with the money. Nothing at all. Uh, Colin Milani, good morning to you. How are you? Hey, Ger, how's it going? Hi, Ashling. What's going things? on? Not too bad now. That uh, golf stuff is just bizarre, isn't it? I mean, GMAC yesterday, bloody hell. Sometimes yeah. you're just better saying nothing, aren't you? I'm unavailable for, uh, I suppose, maybe the, now, the price of... Yeah. you got to do the press. I give him credit for actually doing it, and he did try and address some of the more challenging questions, I think, more so than some of the other players have, but, I mean... It's, oh my it's God, just hard it to believe. Yeah. It's and, Operation uh, Human Shield, isn't it? It's yeah. like uh, Greg Norman's had enough, Phil Mickelson's had enough, somebody else has to go. Dustin Johnson doesn't all care. He's like, well, I mean, uh, you know, I'd like to play and everything and then I'm going to make all the money and that's all. Yeah. And GMAC is like, okay, they put me up here with this guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to answer some questions here. Yeah. Um, and he right. did in fairness to him. Phil Mickelson press conference? Can I do that one instead? instead yeah. Uh, he did try and address some of this stuff, but why don't they just come out and say I'm here for the money they're paying me yeah, too much you'd have why more respect you actually you'd be like alright grand yeah. that's actually you so you've, at least you've said it yeah. not that you're proud to, to help them build the game of golf yeah I, like proud what I, I do think that though like um, in years to come we're going to look back on that press conference the, 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 the bit this has been incredibly polarising take the Khashoggi situation we all agree that was reprehensible Take the Khashoggi situation. It's like the the murder and dismemberment of a journalist who was doing his job because he was investigating the ruling family. And now you work for the ruling family. Take the Khashoggi situation. It was a murder. Like it was the murder of an innocent man. And the extraordinary rendition and murder of somebody. Like the kidnapping and murder of somebody. That's what that was. But he's sitting up at a press conference getting paid to go, I'm actually here to help... Uh, fix the reputation of the people who did this. It's my job to fix the reputation of the country who are behind this. And I'm doing it because I love golf. But it's actually, it was murder that they're up there saying, take that situation, it was, it was reprehensible, that's bad. But you know, they're not all bad. They really, they really aren't all bad. Like they're not. But that thing was really bad and I don't really care enough about how bad that was because my pockets are bulging. Mm. It, uh, it's amazing what money will do. And how rich do people need to be? I mean, all of these players are in the top percentile of people in the world, I'm sure, in terms of their riches already. How rich do you need to be and how much money do you need to have? And aside from all of that, just for, as a sports person, that you're willing to chuck in your ability to compete with the best in the world week on week, which you would think is... You know, when money isn't an object, that's where the satisfaction comes and that Dustin Johnson can beat Rory McIlroy or Dustin Johnson can beat uh, the top players in the world to win a Masters or win a US Open. That Graham McDowell can go and compete. His greatest achievement is winning the US Open because it's a major championship. It's uh, where all the best players want to win. And obviously the, the financial incentives come after that. But they're willing to chuck all of that in for handy cash where they can come last at the Centurion Club this week and win 120 grand and move on to the next event, which I find just hard to believe as sports people who would be... They're not sports people, though. That's the thing. They're business people. That's yeah. Well, like, that's what like, he said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I think that what, what's happening here is that um, the romanticism that we all have when we start playing sport or watching sport, it gets blown up, and it, it's been blown up in football but we still kind of pretend that it hasn't been when we're watching um, whatever country versus whatever country. And it's going to be, uh, in the, you know, when Newcastle are playing PSG in the Champions League final in four years' time and the football is great, the quality of the football will be better than anything we've ever seen. It will be, you know, um, oil money versus oil money. And that's been the case for a long period of time. And we've kind of pretended that it isn't because we like the game so much. But what's happening here is that you're just seeing 
like it's naked it's uh, we're not playing sport this isn't a game anymore this is just a business and we're just here as entertainment and you can either take it or, or not but like I don't think I'll ever cheer for Graham McDowell representing Ireland or Europe again. I just won't. I've no interest in in him now as a as a a leader. Or he said we've been role models for twenty years. And role models for kids. I couldn't get over how you could put that in the same conversation in the context of what you're speaking about. Yeah. So. And the thing is, maybe they're the perfect role models for today's society. I don't know, but. Uh, Mm-hmm. And the thing I won't is, be cheering for, for tour, GMAC like, and I really hope he's never the Ryder Cup captain Well I don't think he is now at this stage I think the DP World Tour is in a very difficult situation now they don't they have that strategic alliance with the PGA Tour Yeah but my prediction is that the money will they'll do a deal with the Saudis and everyone will be back in the tent inside 18 months because if the Saudi, if the Saudi Arabians have this much money they can give a billion quid to the two tours and get 10 to 12 tournaments that are under their under the Live Golf auspices and everybody gets to play and the best players in the world continue to play and it's just more money for the PGA Tour and the DP. That's what's happening here. Like, just to, to zoom out one last time on this, right? The the anti-Saudi sentiment that you are experiencing in Newcastle and in uh, golf at the moment is largely driven by the fact that other organisations are suspicious of the Saudi money and yet they're the same organisations that would have taken the Saudi money if they could have. So you have to be, you have to just ask who's asking these questions and, and why all of a sudden is human rights such a big deal when other sports organisations have not previously cared about it. People can say, OK, I'm, I've been made aware of it and so therefore all of a sudden I'm interested in it. And that's fair enough. We, we all have to go on a, a path where you, you become aware of what's right and what's wrong. But, for example, Joe Biden is in Saudi Arabia asking Saudi Arabia for oil this week. Like, America is completely reliant on and will be reliant on into the future uh, oil at a reasonable price from Saudi Arabia. And yet nobody's saying, oh, we have to stop doing business with Saudi Arabia fully. It's like there's, there's this kind of uh, very chaotic approach and case by case, this is this is important. Like, I do I do think that, um, you know, why, why do we stop at Saudi Arabia? Why don't we go ahead and, and say, actually, uh, those Emirates states all have questionable... Uh, human rights issues. The World Cup should be boycotted because it probably should be. And then, like, really, American foreign, foreign policy, are we actually okay with that? Are we really okay with them landing soldiers in Shannon on the way to their really illegal war, ultimately? Not sure that that's right. And so at that point, do we take all the American money out of Ireland and then all of a sudden it's like the whole thing collapses, right? So, and, and this isn't what about it. It's just that, like, we've decided that Saudi Arabia around golf is a big issue on football it's actually been fine they've, they've got through the Newcastle thing now and that's largely over but they're not the only ones who are doing what um, what they're doing loads of other countries are doing the same thing and we're not we're not holding them to account so my prediction is the DP and PGA take the money and this all disappears and everybody goes well it was just it's just business yeah could happen it's going to be very interesting to see what they do and the fact that the prospect of the major champions championships being weakened by the PGA Tour or the organisations that run them, for Augusta, for example, having to ban players that play on the LAV Golf Tour, it weakens their field. And then what sort of product do they have? So I can see your point of view in that they will come around to that and uh, try and come to an agreement where everybody can play where they want to play, uh, regardless of the source of the money or the formats or so on and so forth but it's going to be very very interesting to see what happens yeah the money doesn't know where it comes from is the other uh, great line that they all use in this uh, anything else very quickly well the uh, Republic of Ireland of course in action tonight in the Nations League they take on Ukraine at the Aviva Stadium four days on from their shock 1-0 defeat to Armenia in Yerevan elsewhere tonight in the same group Scotland host Armenia while in Liga Wales take on the Netherlands in Cardiff last night Harry Kane scored his 50th international goal England earning a one all draw with Germany in Munich uh, Italy top of that group they were two and winners against Hungary last night
In uh, other news today, former FIFA president Sepp Blatter and ex UEFA boss Michel Platini are due to appear at a Swiss court on corruption charges today. Blatter is accused of authorising a payment of 2 million Swiss francs to, from FIFA to Platini in 2011. They've both always denied wrongdoing. In tennis world men's number three, Alexander Zverev looks like he's out of Wimbledon. He's undergone surgery on an ankle ligament injury sustained in last week's French Open semi-final with Rafa Nadal. Ireland uh, women's cricketers face their South African counterparts today in their third and final T20 International. That's at Pembroke later this afternoon at half past four, weather permitting. The series is tied at a match apiece. And racing this afternoon is at Wexford from two o'clock, while in Cork they're underway from five past five. Carl, good stuff. Thanks very much for that. Oops. It is uh, 8.53 and that's today's papers. There are so many idiots out there, so many spoofers. There's a lot of horse. I think he's a total spoofer. What do you mean a spoofer? He's a bullshit. Ah, no, Emma, come on, don't be, don't be, no, I'm not, yes. no. It's 8.54 this morning, OTBAM brought to you live by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Matt Williams, good morning to you, how are you? Good morning to you, very good, mate. Um, look, the, the URC is a, a, a difficult thing to analyse sometimes. It, it has reached the point that it's reached through a torturous path we remember it as the Celtic League and the Magners League and it had a, a kind of quaint local nature to it. Now it's this uh, global corporation trying to be forward thinking and, and catapulting rugby into the future. And yet we have a 70 point whooping in the quarterfinals uh, before the lowest crowd or one of the lowest crowds that Leinster have had all season. That's not really how the competition wants to be thought of it, is it? Yeah, it's a difficult one, Jer, because... Uh Look, Irish people just value the Heineken Cup so highly. Uh, and to be fair to the Leinster supporters, I was at pitch side in Marseille a week before because a lot of people spent a lot of money to uh, to get to uh, Marseille and they might have had the money for the next week. Um, so that's one side of the crowd which I can fully understand and the disappointment and the negativity that surrounded uh, the Leinster defeat, which I thought was totally out of proportion, I've got to say. Leinster was 74 seconds away from lifting the Heineken Cup again and they got pilloried, which I thought was, one, highly inaccurate and, uh, two, totally um, unbalanced. And the third part I, I have to put in with that is, is it gets no publicity compared to the Heineken Cup, does it? And, you know, it's a real problem for Ireland. If... if if Ireland doesn't value its domestic league, and it doesn't, then, then what's, we're really in trouble. I've been saying this for a number of years now, and I think the problem sits with the Irish rugby supporters. Now, do the French value the top 14? Absolutely. Do they value the, the English value of their premiership? They do. And the argument that the, uh, that the URC is weak doesn't stand up because there were four, the four Irish provinces made the top 16 of uh, the Heineken Cup. Four English clubs made it as well. So, you know, not all the English clubs make it, not all the French clubs make it. There are weak, very poor and weak clubs in every competition. The fact that the Irish clubs are dominant in this period, and believe me, sport, that will change in the future, um, is, is having a biased impact or biasing the way we view the competition in Ireland. Um, I don't agree with all the things, that, all the changes that uh, the, the uh, organisers or the, the uh, administrators of the URC have done. But I also think that the way Ireland views its domestic competition is very problematic for Irish rugby. Uh, how do we change that? Or, or is it... I don't know, because it looked like there was a great atmosphere at Ravenhill for the game between Mun yes. Munster and Ulster. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that everybody knew what the result was going to be. Uncertainty of outcome in the game... Uh, with Leinster, just wasn't there. Look, the, the, the Leinster are the best team in Europe. Now, I know they lost to La Rochelle. Like, that's a fact. We were there. I saw it firsthand. It was incredibly uh, hard to conceive how poorly La Rochelle played up to the 64th minute mark. They were very, very poor. And again, that hasn't been reported really accurately. And then somehow they, they found this way to win, which was extraordinary for Ryan and the team. They deserve full credit. Nothing away from La Rochelle. But Leinster are just head and shoulders above every team they've played, except La Rochelle. And they should win this tournament 
running away because they're that good. Now, they smashed Glasgow. That, you know, everyone's going to say, well, oh, Glasgow are poor. Glasgow were made to look poor. Now, here's the other part to this. I, I talking amongst the old lens, the players that, that I'd coached, a few of us were texting each other and talking on the phone. We were really worried that how could this Leinster team gather itself after such a devastating loss in Marseille, and it was devastating. It's the type of loss that will hang around a club for a decade. It was unbelievable that they got themselves into that circumstance. It, in, in hindsight, it will be regarded as one of, if not the greatest wins or, or, or surprise wins against the odds in a final in the history of the Heineken Cup. Now, when you win, you are emotion incredibly high. When you lose, you go very low. Both have an emotional recovery. And we question, how do the players and staff recover in seven days? I actually thought Leinster were vulnerable that day. And so did a lot of other people close to the club. Now, the fact that they came out and were just so clinical, so physical, so angry, so unbelievably accurate, and they didn't take their foot off the throat. At one second. Look, that game was over at half time. They could have cruised in the second half. Mate, they were angry. And that tells you a lot about the character of that club. And yeah, Leo and the players, not, not any of us that used to be there, but the current group, they deserve huge praise. And we all need to look and see what sort of character of the human beings are involved at the club that could do that. And I, I, if I was in the Glasgow dressing room that day, I, I, I thought they were very, very poor and I thought they, the fence fell apart. But they were dismantled like I've very rarely seen a professional team dismantled. And, the, and instead of criticising Glasgow, although they deserve criticism and they have got it, um, we should be looking at Leicester and going, wow, we've got a club that is extraordinary at the moment. And that's not going to last, you know. Again, look at Munster 10 years ago. Look, at, look it, it's, it's sickly. And it's not going to last for everyone. But we, we've got to appreciate them while we've got it. Now, it's a shame they didn't win Europe. But that doesn't make them failures. Uh, and they should go on to win this competition pretty, pretty easily. It was very impressive to, to see them come back and bounce back like that. But I also think 76-14, do you take a lot from that? What do you... Like in their semi-final against Toulouse, they had reached such a high. And I often wonder, you know, to back that up constantly going into the next game, do you take anything from a, a 76-14 win? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You're in a knockout comp. Do La Rochelle care that they won with with uh, uh, 74 seconds to go? I couldn't give a hoot. It's, it's, you've, got, you've got to get through one stage to get to the next. La Rochelle. Ra- Ronan O'Gara is just, he's just on this incredible roll. If I, I, mean, I explain this to, if we come back to the Leinster point, they should, La Rochelle should have lost against Racing. Teddy Thomas had the ball. All he had to do was pass to to uh, uh, Juan Imhoff, who was unmarked five minutes from the racing try line, and La Rochelle had gone. And he and he, he inexplicably didn't pass. You know, and like that, that's how close it is. Then La Rochelle had gone. You've got to win each one. The fact they won by 70 points, what do you take about it? We've got a semi now. We've got the balls coming up from, from uh, South Africa, and we've got to deal with them. And then if we deal with them, We'll get up. We should get a home final, but you know, uh, and I would think that will be against the Stormers. Even though I, I really want Ulster to win, they, they got to again. The 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 problem bringing the South Africans in, you got to go down there and come back. I've done that in Super Rugby, and it's unbelievably hard to travel to to travel and perform, and then travel back and perform. It's it's such a massive task, and, and very few clubs in the history of Super Rugby could do that. Only the great Auckland team and the great Canterbury teams were teams that did it regularly. Very few other clubs could do it. So, so what do you take out of it? They're alive in the competition. There's a semi, there's a trophy, and they're going to they they're on track to win it for the sixth time. And they don't want to lose that. And here again, I think in your in your question, actually, and not being disrespectful in any way, th- there is not valuing Leinster, and there is not valuing the competition. They've smashed a club, smashed a club in the quarterfinal. And instead of looking at the weakness of the club, we should be uh, of the competition. We should be looking at the greatness of the club. And Leinster just, for whatever reason, doesn't seem to be getting that. Um, and, and look, I, I I don't know, and it's not for me to change. 
I can only tell you what I see from my point of view and and what I feel we should be saying. Now, let, let me let me switch that on its head. If Ireland were winning Six Nations and Ireland were coming out and just losing the World Cup, we would still be pretty happy. Yet when Leinster just lose these games at the top end of Europe, we're highly critical and we keep saying, oh, the club's finished, they can never do it, they want it. Look, it's, that's just not sport. It's just not real. It, 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 there's so many variables in sport, especially in rugby. The variables are just massive because of the referees and so on. I thought referee Barnes had a really poor game in that particular game. But it shouldn't take away from A, La Rochelle have done a great job and so has Rana Gara. But Leinster are not failures and they're not going away. And they proved that last Saturday. And, and they can talk about it like I'm talking about it but it's their actions that count. Wow, well, I thought their actions were just sensational. Um, why do you think they did lose? What what, what prevented them? So we did all the pre-match um, mm. analysis and, and we talked to the the stats guys and, and they were saying, you know, there's there's various metrics that we can see Leinster are so far ahead of the rest of Europe when in, in European competition against uh, similar standard opposition as opposed to the URC in terms of rook speed and uh, you know, just general creativity, all the metrics you would look for to explain why we felt they were the best team in Europe. And yet they didn't perform at that level in the final. And obviously, retrospectively, we went back and looked at the analysis and it turns out they weren't allowed to because La Rochelle had a very good game plan around making sure that Leinster had to commit an extra man to the rook. And so that's slow. That had this ripple on impact across their ability to create space out wide. And it all makes perfect sense. It was a brilliant game plan executed very well by... Um, by La Rochelle but there was also the other thing was that Leinster took points and kept the scoreboard ticking over which is kind of un-Leinster like when you look at their performance over the season so uh, if if Leinster are, are doing what New Zealand did when they lost the 0-3 World Cup which I suspect they will do there'll be a long kind of why why are we not getting over the line when, when you know we think we're the best team in Europe and a lot of the metrics are pointing that way what's the gap between them achieving what they think they should achieve and uh, and the performance that they put in in the final. What what's the bit that gets them over the line the next time? Well, I'll pick that apart. Look, I got to disagree with everyone. Lara Shell were absolute rubbish up to the sixty fourth minute mark, with the exception of Raymond Rule's try, which was quite excellent. But they were poor. Do you, do you remember how many passes they dropped? How many poor penalties they gave away? Like the scrum penalties, more penalties, which were offside. They were very ill-disciplined. And if they had a loss, which they should have, if we go back and they should have, Ronan would have copped a huge criticism and Lara Shaw would have copped huge criticism. Everyone says it's a brilliant game plan. Well, look, I don't think it was. I think Leinster stuffed up. And I, I would, and now here's the other part. Every time Johnny got a shot at goal, what's your, my gut instinct of watching... 50 years of rugby and being involved in the top end, take the points. It's a final, take the points, take the points. What they couldn't do and what La Rochelle did do well was disrupt the flow of the game. Leinster couldn't get rucks going. They couldn't get pace going. And it's the pace on the game that they do well. When La Rochelle got sinbin, that game was over. Leinster were going to win that game. And then these tiny margins come into play. What was one of them? It was bloody hot there. I hadn't factored that in, i got to say. Uh, Joe Malloy said to me, oh, well, a wet day might throw Leinster out. I said, mate, south of France, late May, it's not going to be a wet day in Marseille. And then I went, mm, might be hot. I was on the sideline, mate. I was saturated it with sweat. It was really, really hot. That was hard. And that came into play late in the game. Second part, referee Barnes let La Rochelle get away with blue murder at the break There should have been sin bins much, much earlier for La Rochelle. Bounce of the ball. If that ball... Doesn't doesn't touch uh, Jimmy O'Brien's shorts as it's bouncing over the touching goal line. It's a scrum 50 metres downfield. Leinster put in. Instead, it's a dropout and subsequently a line dropout. And subsequently, La Rochelle score. The margins are just so fine. And I will say this: Leinster didn't play well, and I think there was pressure on themselves. I don't know that's just that's like New Zealand, um, as you said, uh, Brad Thorne. I've heard him tell the story of post uh, winning the World Cup, the seconds after they walked into the change room, and he just laid down on the floor and started crying. Now, this is Brad Thorne. This is one of the greatest 
rugby and rugby league players uh, the world soon since the Second World War. And he was just saying it was pressure getting away. That they were, thank God, that they got rid of it. And unfortunately, through a whole series of, of events, Leinster are now in that position where everyone's questioning them, everyone's saying what they can. You know, if you don't know if you, you guys might remember, but when, when Australia beat New Zealand in the uh, uh, semi final of the 2003 World Cup with about a minute to go, George Gregan looks at Byron Kelleher and says, Four more years, Byron. Four <laughs> more years. Just mounting the pressure back on the four more years, you've got to carry that burden. Leinster only have 12 months with the Aviva at home. It is not, it is not like one massive thing. We watch sport over so many, you, you guys more than me. Like I, I watch rugby, you guys watch everything. How many times have we seen a final where a team is dominated and they lose the final? We've seen it in World Cups. We've seen it in FA Cups. We've seen it. We, we, we see it every single competition. Not every year, but regularly we see it. And that was just that day. It was Lara Shell's day. Nothing was going to stop that. The rugby gods had it there. And um, good luck to Ronan, but I... I I saw Leinster players um, and coaches as devastated as I've ever seen a rugby player or rugby coach. They were they were more than, than heartbroken. It was beyond that. There was a grief. And the fact that they found a way mentally to gather themselves and put in that performance mm-hmm. last you know, I just I just can't speak highly enough of 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 that performance. And I know I know Glasgow were, were poor. And I, let, let's forget the 70. Let's just forget the ability to come out and win and win well. That's probably all settled down now. They're back on track. And uh, I, I expect them to play particularly well again this weekend. Uh, are they going to win this weekend? It's a home game against a South African team who've had to travel a good South African team who uh, are definitely not going to be beaten at the gates. So this is going to be one that will be in the melting pot, hopefully from a neutral's perspective and from a Leinster fan's perspective. You want to see like them win some close games? Yeah, oh, look, I, I think the, the South Africans at the beginning of the season, I, I was very disappointed with. Um, a lot of us who have been involved with Super Rugby thought they'd come up and really show some good form and play great rugby, and they didn't. You remember they came through uh, Ireland um, at the beginning of the season and lost every game. So I was quite shocked at that, but I think the Africans have adjusted. It's a different style of rugby, very different refereeing, very different to super rugby. They've also got on top of the travel. The travel is so hard. I can't stress to you and your listeners how hard it is to pick your bag up from your house and 18 hours later get in your hotel and then maybe five, six days later, depending on when you can get the flight and when the game is, you've got to perform again. Pick your bag up, do the 18 hours back and do it again. Like that is is monumentally difficult. And the Africans have come to grips with that. Obviously, their sports scientists have figured out ways to minimise the fatigue and how they train and what they do and what their preparation is. And I think that their players have also adjusted to the pace and what the, the game is. And, and that they'll be much, much stronger opposition um, than they were at the beginning of this season. Jake White's a fantastic coach, a uh, great psychologist, and uh, I expect them to not try and play like Leinster. They'll play like the South Africans do, which is a lot of power, a lot of a lot of line speed in D and a lot of aggression. And I think it'll be a much, much closer game. And it's flipped the other way around then for Ulster against Stormers. So they're the ones that are going to have yeah. to make the trip and obviously factor in all of that travel. And I'm sure it does have an impact on how they play. Oh, for sure. Uh, look, if, if I had to make a, a crystal ball prediction, which after... The, after the Heineken Cup final, I'm very reluctant to do because I thought Leinster were going to win that going away. Um, you'd have to say that Leinster, that the home teams are favourite, the Stormers and Leinster are favourites. I'm not. It's not beyond us. I think Ulster are playing great rugby, and they showed that last week at home. They're a different boost at home, but they've been very strong on the road at times as well this year. Ulster, and they've got a good team. Um, Obviously, no Michael Lowry, which is a, a blow to them. That's mm-hmm. that wasn't from last week. They're they're pretty much intact from last week. So I, I think that they'll do a close game. It's also they've got a plus. It's not at altitude. It's different when you go to Pretoria or Joburg, which is up about five thousand meters, and that's that's a huge huge difference to being at sea level at Cape Town or Natal. 
So I think they have a little bit of an advantage there. I think they, they can win. I think they've got a lot better chance than the Bulls. But I, I still think the Stormers, with the travel, um, may have the advantage on that one, which is a shame because I, I'd like to see Ulster reach the final. It would be a great, uh, great reward for them. All right, Matt, we'll leave it there. Good stuff as ever. Thanks a million. Pleasure now. It's Matt Williams giving us some thoughts on the uh, URC and ultimately the demise of Leinster in the Hunting Cup final this year. OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Here's what's coming up on OTB Sports Radio between now and 7 o'clock tonight. OTB Gold is Sonia Sullivan at 1. Koigig is the Sue Ronan interview. The retro panel is about losing the dressing room. Manu Petit is OTB Gold and then the show is live tonight from 7 as ever. Follow off the ball across all our social channels. Subscribe to our YouTube be sure to download the OTB Sports app. We're back with David Myler previewing tonight's Ukraine game after these. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The Hurling Pod on OTB Sports. You just said this, right? I have to go with Hurling Land. I'm not the hurler of the year candidate. I'd, 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 <laughs> what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is, I'd have to take out. Okay, I'd take out Conor Whelan then. Conor Whelan I, That's it. I quit. Join myself, Will O'Callaghan, along with James Skehill and Paul Murphy for the best insight this hurling season. Subscribe to the GA podcast feed on the OTB Sports app now. Marginal gains? XG? Top speed? Recovery? What's it all about? Want to improve but don't know where to start? With more data than ever now available, OTB Sports have teamed up with Whoop to cut through the noise and help you raise your game, no matter the sport. OTB Sports are delivering the metrics that matter. Meaningful metrics in partnership with Whoop, the personalized digital fitness and health coach that helps you unlock your inner potential. See Whoop.com for more. Follow OTB Sports social channels for the best insights and stats this season. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, David Myler is with us. David, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. What's the crack? Not much, not much. You? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, long time no see. First time, first time caller, first time meeting. I bumped into you at the Champions League final. I know, I know, I know. I wasn't in the mood to talk, Jar. No, I have to say, I have to say, David, you're uh, much bigger in real life than I thought you were. I was like, wow, I'm looking up at David Myler here. It's like, uh, I, I was Googling your height afterwards going, what? I had no idea you were such a big man. Oh, no, I'm six foot three. Uh, six foot three. There you go. I Colin Buig was oh. gone. He's only six foot six two. Six foot two, yeah. yeah. There's a, no, there's a significant no. difference. One metre ninety is what I am. There you no go. No claims. It claims online in 189, but don't worry. I'm clinching onto that six three. Yeah, it, it had been a long day for everybody at that stage. We met after the game. Um, yeah. I don't know if I was just about to be tear gassed or if I'd already been tear gassed, but um, there was certainly, mm. it, was, it was floating around on the wind. What was your experience like of getting into the game? Yeah, uh, Horrific. Uh, to be honest, um, I was like, I don't ask me exactly. I came through that bypass uh, underneath the tunnel, do you know, where the, the bus had obviously cornered off a little tight little alleyway for people to come through. And I came through um, with, I don't know, 15, 20,000 people, um, which is just ridiculous. Um, like it was just, it, it, it's almost hard to kind of relive it because there was so many people trying to get through and, People were obviously rushing to get to the game. People were banging off one another. Um, and then obviously once we got up towards the stadium, obviously then you had to go and into your um, into your gate. They were closed. Um, I gave myself good time. Usually I'm quite relaxed. You know, with football, I'm not really too entertained with warm-ups and kind of, I kind of get in there. But on that occasion, I decided to get there early. And obviously the barriers were shut. Uh, people were up against the barriers. And then all of a sudden... People were gonna get pressed up against the barriers, and there was a somebody in my section where I was. Somebody forced the barrier open, um, and then the police rammed it shut. Then the tear gas and the pepper spray came. Um, it was just a horrific experience, to be honest. Um, on the whole thing, I, look, I imagine everybody, including yourselves, who've you know watched the news, whatever, would have seen some some of the stories. But yeah, I was right involved in it, um, and it was. Do you know what? It was scary. Um, it's the first time I've been to a football match where I've actually been scared and been worried because it was just, you know, the actions of the French police were just, you know, uncalled for. Um, and the whole thing was, there's no other way to really put it. The whole thing was a shit show. 
you can see how easy it is for uh, that scenario to go pear-shaped really quickly. Somebody gets frightened or a noise happens and there's a push and all of a sudden the barrier's there and loads mm. of people are getting pushed up against it. Yeah, and like um, I, I hadn't anything to drink at that time. Um, so I was like fully aware of what I was doing and everything. The, the biggest problem I found was the people who were right up the front by the barriers obviously weren't being left in, but the people who were behind them, like I'm going to say like oh, six, seven rows back, didn't know what was going on. And they were kind of just chit-chatting, kind of coming forward every time, thinking like, oh, people are getting in. And then all of a sudden you just have this like, you know, compressed group of people up against the barrier. Um, and it was like, that was the thing that was, you know, young boys and girls and um, teenagers just, you know, stuck. Um, and then uh, on a different occasion, there was a big group of like young lads came. I'll never forget it because like they had snoods on and um, some had like hats on, like covering up to their face. And they were like trying to run through. Um, I imagine, look, I imagine they were young lads from Paris or whatever. Obviously, no one at Champions League final was on. They were desperate to try and sneak into the stadium. But they were just like running over the top of people, banging into people, trying to force their way through. And it, it, it like I was at that at that moment in time, I was with you'll have seen me. I was with a friend and his wife, um, and he he had a, a bit to drink, um, but she wasn't, and like she was upset, she was crying, she was getting barraged and whatever. And she said, like after I remember after she says, I'm never coming to a football game again if this is what goes on. Um, and like it, it it was it was frightening. Um, well, can you imagine bringing your kids? Yeah, and them seeing that like that is horrific. Like. <sighs> You know, if, if you're you're speaking like that, Dave, imagine a kid, what what they're thinking now. That oh, that's what it's like to, oh. to go to a football game. Like this is bucket list stuff for people. Like this is, you know, take it off the mm. list to go to a Champions League final and then for this to happen is horrific. It, it, it was. And like what what actually scared me the point after was like I've got two young kids, my daughter's my daughter's six and my son is three. Uh we were on a family holiday in Portugal, so I flew from Portugal over um to Paris. And I said to my wife, like, if my son was six or seven, I'd have probably brought him. Um, this is just like an... Oh, the line's gone. We got him back. But, uh, yeah. Oh, it's... that is harrowing listening to that. Like, that's the first time I think I've heard someone speak really in detail about how it was for them and how close he was at the barrier. And... You get claustrophobic just listening to it. Yeah. When he was saying he was coming through the tunnel and there was that many people you actually just get shivers. It was, it, was, uh, it was no crack. It was certainly no crack. Uh, David's back, sorry. Yeah, you, we, you said you would have brought your, your, your son if he was a bit older. Yeah, that was the thing. And like, I was like, I would have, look, I'm very fortunate that I have friends who play and whatever and I can, I can get my hands on tickets. So I was like, the opportunity to bring my son to a Champions League final or whatever. Now he's too young now, obviously, but in a few years' time, I'd hope to bring him. But I was there like, like after, I was like, I'm never bringing him to the Champions League final again if it's in, like in Paris or France or whatever because like the whole thing was scary. And as I said, the crowds, it was like young lads, teenagers who'd lost their family, like 12, 13 were going to be like, oh, I'm lost. I don't know where my family is. And it, this is the hard thing. I had my friend's wife crying and I was like, there's just so much going on here. I, I don't even know what to do. And another case then, there was the armed police were running down the road Um I think there was about, say, I'm going to say probably 40 of them in lines of two. So there have been 20, line of 20 in twos. But they were just running down the middle of the road. And they had the bat on in the right hand and their shield in the left hand. And anyone who was in their line got banged. Like I've seen, like, young boys and girls, uh, teenagers, grown men, women, like old men and old women were just getting barraged out of the way. If you weren't in their line, you were fine. But if you were just, you know, chit-chatting, walking along, looking at whoever you're speaking to, you were getting banged out of the way. I was just thinking, this, is, this isn't this is what it should be about. Um, it was, it, like, that was the thing. And then you go and you watch the football match, you lose, um, which is, like, heartbreaking. And then you come out and then you hear all the stories of, you know, people getting robbed. Um, obviously, like I said, I was in Portugal at the time and there was a lad, um, a, um, a lad from Liverpool there who came over to the game with me. Um, his neighbour got stabbed. Um, uh, he got robbed, stabbed. Uh, another fella got, he said, got cut with a knife, but lucky enough, he had a jacket on, so it didn't actually do any damage to him. It ripped his jacket. Like when you hear stories like that after, you just think like, like wow. Um, like even even for me, 
I had my mum messaging me, my sister messaged me, all my friends messaging me. Um, are you okay? Are you safe? Um, lucky enough, look, I was I was okay. Yes, I did get tear gas and pepper spread. Um, but I was okay, I was fine. Um, but it was, it was one of those where it was you did you did get scared. Um and then obviously the football didn't help either. No, 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 it was, uh, it was, uh, as you say, a shit show is the only way to describe it. Um, and then mm. so, uh, when you left, did you end up getting the subway away or how did you get away? Well, the people, the people I were with uh, were part of the Liverpool friends and family. Okay. Um, so I watched a call. I walked with them. I walked with them to the, the buses that Liverpool had put on. Okay. Just because I didn't want to, like, one, I didn't want to be on my own walking around Paris. Um, I know it's, it's not technically Paris. Um, but in that vicinity. Um, so I walked with them to the bus and then I just, I ended up blagging a taxi. I paid over the odds because some fella said, well, I'm here to wait someone. And I said like, I'll double the fare because I don't want to be walking around these streets. Um, so I got, um, I got in a taxi. Um, I went to the, what you call it, one of the hotels where the, where the families were staying to meet some, you know, some friends. And then I went to the airport after and I flew back to Portugal the following morning. Yeah. Um, because we ended up going down the subway and like to get onto the subway there was a big queue down a very narrow walkway which at one point they were just tear gassing people away from because there was too many people there They're, the way they were mm. controlling the crowd was to like spray the little mosquito spray of, of pepper ridiculous. spray you know? it's... But where else are we supposed to go like I know oh, and that was a, that, that was the thing and you know to see the accounts then like of saying oh it was all the Liverpool fans fault it wasn't look don't get me wrong I'm not oblivious before anyone tries to correct me of course, there's going to be incidents where Liverpool fans were wrong. You know what I mean? That's that's human nature. And you go to any any sporting event, there's going to be a couple of idiots. Um, but I'm going to say the 95% of Liverpool fans I saw were completely fine. There was no problem. Um, they just wanted to go and watch their team, support them. And they got treated like animals. Yeah. And for those kids that are like saying that they were lost, coming up to David saying they're lost, and then you see the police... And they're there with their batons. You'd normally see the police and think, "Okay, grand, I'll, I'll run over and see if I can find my mom or dad or whatever the situation is." But they're probably running away from them. Yeah, and that was that was the that was the scary thing is like, where do you where do you go? Because a lot of the French police didn't speak English. They didn't want to help. Um, like they were probably, I imagine they had a briefing before and said, "Be on high alert." Um, and they they took no prisoners. They really didn't. They just didn't care. Um, there's enough accounts of people getting hit by police. Like, as we said, the pepper spray, the tear gas, everything. It was just, it was just, like, even looking back on it now, it's the first time I've really spoken about it because I actually can't believe what I went through in that 24 hours and what I saw. And I think, is this, like, I had been to the Wanda Metropolitano in Madrid when Liverpool beat Spurs, and there was not one case of that. Um, there was no, like, we walked up to the stadium, walked straight in. There was no problem, like, it was meant to be, I believe in Paris, it was meant to be six or seven like ticket checks. Like nobody ever checked my ticket until I was actually like, eventually when they started opening barriers, when I went in through the barrier and they didn't even really check it. It wasn't scanned and I just went in. Um, it's whereas mad. When I was, yeah, the whole, the, I, it's, 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 it's hard to even fathom what they were thinking and what was going on. Like, like I said, when I went to Madrid, you had about four ticket checks. And there was police, it was like lines of police and there was no bother. They just said like, we're checking you, I imagine for the weapons or contraband or drugs or whatever. And then we went on to the next one. Can you show your ticket, please? This is the area you're going to. Then there was another one, but there was no, like it, you, you didn't mind getting checked because there was never any delay or anything. It was just people who were organized doing their job. Whereas Paris was just a disaster. Yeah, yeah. Right, let's talk about tonight. Um, uh, difficult situation for Ireland in that all of a sudden we need to win games. Um, you know, if we'd, if we'd won at the weekend, a draw tonight and everybody would have been okay. There's some signs of progress. So uh, a lot's going to be made of the team selection and a lot's going to be made of the performance. Um, what, what do you think we need to get from tonight for us to feel good about where the team are going and how we're progressing? After losing to Armenia, I think that everyone will go into the game expecting us, well, not expecting, but wanting us to win. Um, obviously, you, you're looking at the group with, you know, Ukraine, Scotland and ourselves. You'd expect us three will be battling out for top spot. 
Um, you'd expect both, all three teams to want to beat Armenia home and away. Obviously, we've been unfortunate to lose to Armenia. So now we're going into this game tonight where we can't afford to lose. Um, and then with with the added incentive of us, of us being at home, I, we need to get a result. We need to you know win the game. Um, I don't think there's any sugar coat in that. But there's been there's been plenty of experiences in the past where we've been in qualifying groups where we've lost games. If you remember back um, in my own time in 16, we lost to Scotland away. Um, which was seen as catastrophic, um, and then we went and we got a, a you know result against Germany, which no one expected us, which leapfrogged us back into the group. So, you know that the lads are going to be fully aware that they're going to have to go out and perform, um, and they're going to have to you know go and win the game. Um, Ukraine obviously are off the back of the Wales game, which will be a huge blow to them. Their manager said, I think he's going to change a lot of the team, so players are going to come in and they're going to be fresh. I think you, you know you touched on you know Stephen's team selection, and um, that's going to be real important. I imagine there won't be a lot of changes. Um, I know obviously Shams has ruled out with injury, but I I, I would highly highly say that they're, they're going to be more or less the same team. And um, you probably expect Cyrus to come in for Shamus, but the rest will be more or less the same, and he'll show that fate in that group to kind of go out and get a result. Does he need another body in midfield? Uh, we expect Ukraine probably going to play with three in there, which would give them a new numerical superiority does that mean maybe somebody like Troy Park gets sacrificed for Knight or or Alan Brown or somebody um it's an interesting one like obviously if 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 we're going to be have large amounts of possession obviously you know we're going with this possession based football now and we're trying to play a lot more if he does play the five and the two midfield yes they are they are outnumbered but if our front three can pin them back um you know can keep their back four occupied, then we can we can play with the two midfield. If we're going to be turning over possession loosely, um, it's going to be a long you know long evening for Cullen and Hendrick if they're playing. Um, the other one then is do you, do, do you can continue with that and you kind of get Troy to drop deep as a ten, so the two can play as the base and he can be just in front of them and kind of play that way. Um, so that you know in possession. You could look at kind of a five-two-three, but out of possession, and you're kind of a five-three-two um, with the two. The other two, you know, Chidoza and uh, Callum would narrow up as kind of almost inverted forwards. Um, it's an interesting one just to see what way he'll go. Of course, like you said, he could take Troy out um, and put in another, you know, num- another midfielder like Alan Brown, who's lots of energy, who will get forward, who will get into the box. Um, it's going to be, a, it's, it's certainly going to be an interesting one to see when once the team is announced. Can I ask you a question? One of the things that we, we talked a lot about is players playing football. Uh, for their clubs and, and coming and playing and how important it is to be playing. When when you were joining up with the squad, was there a difference in how you felt prepared for playing international football when you were in teams and when you weren't in teams? Was Did it make a significant difference? And in retrospect, were your performances always significantly better when you were playing week in, week out versus when maybe you weren't playing week in, week out? Um, I... Uh... If I if I look at myself um, as an isolated case, it wouldn't have mattered a whole lot for me if I was playing or not playing going into international because I've said 150 times on on off the ball like playing for Ireland was might be a, an end all. It's all I ever wanted to do was to play for my country. Um, it wouldn't have mattered if I had no fitness or whatever. But at the same time, if boys are playing regularly, um, training regularly then of course you feel sharp um, like that's that's the big thing and if, if you come into these international games you're sharp and you feel that um, of course then if you're not there's the added pressure but then you look at Shane Duffy starting his other day hasn't played in a long time with you know Brighton but you know he put in a solid performance um, you wouldn't really fault him for anything in the game um, but then once you come up against better opposition who are playing regularly they will have that sharpness um, that is that is a major thing but is it a big deal? No, it's not. Obviously, it's it's better if a player is playing week in, week out. That when they come in, that they are fresher. They're you know they're up to speed. Um, but in my own case, there was times when it didn't really matter because I'd have ran through the brick wall and I wanted to play, so I'd been fine. And David, I'd love to hear your opinion overall in the the Nations League. Do the players look a bit shattered? Almost like they need a break. Like it feels like I know some of the Ireland players haven't had a lot of game time maybe with their clubs, but they've still been around, you know, been there in the club setup, the whole lot. It still, you know, takes its toll. 
and then they come straight into international duty. I just felt like, wow, they just look like they need a bit of a rest. And it is, it is difficult because, like, like you said, when you when you're grafting for nine months, and even if you're not playing week in week out, you're still training five days a week. I mean, you're still putting your body through enormous stress, and then you've got the the emotional side of of football where you're thinking like, well, I'm not playing. I need to be in the team. Do I need to move? Do I need to speak to the manager? What what's best? And then when you kind of come towards the end of the season, you feel like, oh well, we're there. But then all of a sudden, certainly the players in the championship will have that little break. If they don't make the playoffs, they'll have that little break where then you go into the internationals and you're trying to like almost get back up to rhythm and get back into into the flow of it again. Um, the internationals in the summer can be can feel like a groundhog. Um, and certainly then when you've got, you know, as many games as we do, um, like this is, I can't remember the last time Ireland played four games in the summer. Um, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable. And then to think they're not friendly. So Stephen can't really afford to, you know, make wholesale changes, make 10 or 11 in a game because each one of these games is important as, you know, the last of the next. Um, so it does feel, it does feel at times when you're coming into international camp like that, you know, you are long drawn out. Um, once these players finish these games, they'll only probably have the best part of two or three weeks. The ones in the championship will be back sooner than the ones in the Premier League. Um, so it can, it can take its toll on a player, but you just got to, I know, park that to one side and think like, I've got four games. We got plenty of time to recover in the hotel, um, even between in between games with the travelling. They're well looked after. Um, so, you know, it's four games to kind of knuckle down and try and get results. What do you think is going to happen tonight? Oh, um, do you know what? Um, I'm expecting I'm expecting a better performance. We've under Stephen. I feel we've always played better against better teams. Um, like you look at the Armenia game the other day, we dominated possession. We had large chunks of it. They were obviously sitting deep trying to catch us. We kind of just ran out of ideas, um, forcing passes, and it was kind of no. Once there was no plan B, but there was no kind of change in attitude from the players on the pitch. So I'm expecting. You know, Ukraine, I imagine the possession will be kind of 50-50 and I think there will be, you know, spaces appear and gaps appear, which then we need the players to be brave, get on the ball and try and create, make something happen. So I'm expecting a bit more of an open game. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get the result, but I kind of see a cagey, a cagey one-all, two-one Ireland game. <laughs> We, we, you know, Ireland won all draws in international uh, football. <laughs> I know. I, do you know what? Do you know what? I'd love to. I'd love to sit here and go. Expect us to win fully two 0 But I just, I just, I just, I just see it. If we, if, if we can get the first goal, I think we'll win the game. But I think if Ukraine were to score first, then I think you know we'll roll our sleeves up, we'll dig deep, and we'll get an equaliser. Um, if we, if we score first, then I think it will give. The crowd an enormous lift. They'll give the players an enormous lift, and I think they'll kick on. But then, as you know, there's been many occasions where we've unfortunately conceded first, and then we start to play, and there's that bit of pressure, and then we get one goal. It's so we we don't really necessarily always get the second. No, no, it's true. David, great stuff this morning. Thanks a million for sharing all that with us. Cheers. No, oh, congratulations on the triathlon. Oh, thanks a million. <laughs> we did it. Yeah, just oh, no. about. Oh, no. Are you? Oh, no. Are you? What, what do you do now to get your physical? And after you finished, like, did you just stop all physical activity straight away, or what do you? How do you stay fit? I don't stay fit. <laughs> um, I play five aside on a Wednesday night, um, so I'm playing. I'm playing tonight at six o'clock. Um, I'll play. It's only forty minutes. Like we we spoke about that. But besides that, I don't go to the gym. I do the odd the odd bit of cycling here and there. Um, you could sign, with, sign up for next year with us. Oh, well, I did ask you how far you went. Um, I think I'd be able to do that. that <laughs> yeah. <one> I know. When you asked me that question, he said, how far was it? I was like, okay, right. It's only 250 metres swim. We, <laughs> might do the, we, we might do the 750 swim next year, but yeah. it's the same. It's a 5K run at the end. Well, George, George, George just, just so you know, my mum swam for Ireland, my sister swam for Ireland. Wow. And, Okay, yeah. your oh, genes are unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, that was the thing. My wife couldn't believe it years ago. My mum used to come on holidays with us, uh, and she'd go off down to the beach and she'd swim in the ocean for an hour. She was preparing herself. I thought, I, I think she did a triathlon as well. Well, there you but go. She, she didn't do it. She didn't do a two hundred and fifty meter one though. She did the full one. Yeah. Well, it's a, uh, so, you, so you're signing up for the full one next year. Is what I hear here. David. That's uh, yeah. No, it's well, just, no. Do you know what? If I'm going to be completely honest with you, I want to do an Ironman. I don't want to do, and then people say, "Oh, you should build it up." And I think, 
well, no, I'd rather just jump into the deep end and go hell for leather and then just go for the, the big one. Well, if you're going to do an Ironman, they do them in Hawaii. That's the one to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, there definitely you, was people you, in our triathlon that Cork, were... don't they? Yeah, in Yol. Yes. Right. There was definitely people in our triathlon that were training for something like they were incredible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like they weren't trying their first triathlon. Not that's like this. Sure. No, there was a guy on the actual yeah, proper bike. Yeah, did you bike. see him? I was like, I, was like, I can't even fix these Hang gears. Hang on a second here. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's, 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 that's part and parcel. I've got a proper road bike and all that. Um, but I just, I just, do you know what? It's still it's still an incredible accomplishment to, you, you, to do it. It is, it's like three different aerobic fitnesses um to combine them all is it is it is hard work but i just want i want to like what is it it's 2.4 mile swim um it's 180 kilometers on the bike and then it's a run a marathon oh the only God. one i'll struggle with <laughs> the only one i feel i'll struggle with will be the running because of my knee and the pounding on the concrete i don't know what i my whole thing was could i run five miles walk a mile run five miles and then obviously break that down into kind of category of five do that five times Oh God, you've taught about yeah. this a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah, you're, I, but, you're telling us about well, it now to manifest it and put it out there, so you have to do it. Isn't that what's going on here? Um, do you know what? I actually want to do a series, like actually go and train properly, because I'm gonna have to train for it. But then obviously do, I won't say a camera crew, but a camera and just record from start to finish. Um, because I believe I've spoken to people who've completed Ironmans. Um, I've probably spoken to a dozen people and the shortest amount of training one person has done for it was four months, but he felt he was in relatively very good condition going into the four months training. The right. rest of them were trained for about seven, eight months. So. That would be a good watch. The clock I would is ticking, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. We're, we're on board if you want to, if you want to. Uh, <laughs> clock, yeah, that's the thing, Jared. The clock's not ticking. I'm 33. <laughs> I am 50. You don't have got plenty of time. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Uh, we we'll definitely yeah, we'll definitely talk to you about that again. I think I could do the swim and the cycle, but I, there's no way I could do the run. I, I I just didn't really enjoy the cycle, but I didn't practice for that whatsoever. As I said, two days before I got the bike, so yeah, well unprepared. Yeah. But I loved the swim. I could have did longer in the swim, and I the run was grand. The next time, the next time you you sign up for one, I'll do it with you. Excellent. Yay, there we go. Right, right, right. Yeah. But on one condition. Go on. I have to be I have to be partnered with Tommy Rooney so I can just laugh at him the whole way around. <laughs> That's the only thing. I just want to, I want to, I want to, like, obviously the swimming, I'll just swim, finish, get out, and then I will wait for him. <laughs> you will be waiting be... for him because I got in last and I, I went by Tommy in the swim. It's a deal. Yeah, I, like, I, Tommy, Tommy's looking for a pair of size 11 trainers the night before <laughs> it starts. Like, where's your preparation? Exactly. You know? Exactly. So Tommy, when you're watching this, Tommy, next year I'll do it with you or whenever you're doing one and I'll run and I'll cycle and I'll swim alongside him just to laugh. That is a deal. That's a deal. Yeah. David, good stuff. Thanks yeah. a million. Cheers. Bye. You there. Bye bye. You never know where it's going to go. 9.41 this morning. Um, if you want to get in touch, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Phil Mickelson is refusing to talk about um, anything to do with human rights and he's also refusing to talk about anything to do with the future of the PGA Tour and his involvement with Live Golf. So it sounds like there's uh, going to be a series of interesting press conferences when it comes to Phil and his engagement with the tour. Uh, tomorrow, we're back from half seven. Shane Hannan is co-hosting. Dion Fanning and Jonathan Wilson are going to chat international football and much more as well. Uh, right now, we're going to leave you with some Tommy Walsh goodness from last night's Off the Ball with Will. Enjoy. See you tomorrow. I guess the story is going to be the fact that Limerick have found answers all the way throughout this Munster Championship. They've run off four in a row now without Keane Lynch. But also... Clare, on three different occasions when games went to 70 minutes this year against Limerick, have been level with them. Limerick haven't been able to beat Clare in normal time. That has to give Clare a lot of hope going into the All-Ireland series, Tommy. Yeah, and I think that's probably something that Brian Lohan has instilled in this team with. Um, I was looking at a, an article James O'Connor wrote in the Sunday Independent uh, last weekend. It was a, a week before the 1997 All-Ireland. And James, he went for a, a score from out the field and it went wide, but Brian Lohan wasn't happy with it and went up and, you know, gave him a, a piece of his mind. And James, he wasn't too happy with it at the time. But a week later, he got the same chance in the All-Ireland final against Tipperary. He put it over the bar. And it just goes to show the mindset of Brian Lohan that standards are set and you must prepare at all times no matter when the occasion is, you prepare as best you can because it's when the 
I suppose game is at its tightest when the moment is cl- when it's clutch. That's when you'll be rewarded. And the standards, Brian Lowe, I've seen him in in earlier uh, the round robin games. I've seen, seen him in I think it was their first game where he wasn't happy with their player players effort in one passage of play. Five minutes later, I say less, he was gone. And they just and, and they were still in the game, winning well. I say even at that time, and they just set the stall for that team. And that's why when Limerick got ahead of them the other day, they weren't able to power on and win by seven or eight points, as you would expect uh, the All Ireland champions to do. No, players stayed going and going. And another part of that was Shane O'Donnell. Will if you remember Shane O'Donnell during that game, his his tackling was ferocious, but he gave away a couple of frees. I'd say three or four or five frees. But listen, his effort was top class. He was just a bit unlucky. Who was the guy that shoved out one of the Limerick players? I think it was a Barry Nash for, for the sideline cut that Tony Kelly pulled over to draw the game. Shane O'Donnell. Again, loan, standards were being set. Although he's a bit unlucky, Shane O'Donnell giving away a couple of frees. He was rewarded when the game was at its tightest. So that's why players were able to, to keep in with these teams. They prepare well. They have some fantastic hurlers. And listen, they'll have to just get ready now for the All-Ireland Series. Yeah, they've got an intensity about them. And when you talk about a player coming up in a clutch moment, Tony Kelly had missed a few frees and Peter Duggan had gone on them, hit the frees pretty well. Still, Tony finished up with 13 points at the end of the game with seven of them coming from play and some of them coming from like ridiculous angles and some of the best points we've seen so far this season. But to step up in the moment where it would have been easy to just take the percentage on that last line ball, play it in, try and work another possession and see if Clare could get a score... Tony Kelly backs his talent to be able to put that over from the left-hand side, even when there was, I think, a can or a bottle thrown at him just before he was about to hit it. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say if someone had to come looking for it, I'd say you would have given it to him, Will. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was um, you know, it was, it was a tight a tight angle. Like, what are the odds of it really going over? Like, there's, there's only the really great players, I'd say, could manage to do it. I'd say if you took that sideline, caught another... 20, 30 times he'd be lucky enough for it to go over. But Tony Kelly, listen, he's been doing it for the last couple of years now. I'd say ever since Brian Lone probably has taken back over the team, he's just been rolling out these 9 out of 10, 10 over performances every day of the week. And um, even as you said, he missed a couple of frees. In the earlier parts of the game, even he was finding things difficult inside in the full forward line. He was on Sean Finn, he was on Mike Casey. But no, he kept going and going and he was rewarded. Like seven points from playing a monster final. It's heroic stuff, and not everyone was going his way, as you said. And even the sideline cuts, like Peter Duggan, if you can remember, took the first sideline mm-hmm. cut and put it over the bar. But then Tony took it back over. Then when 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 it was needed, he stepped up. And I I think as well, great confidence has been given to this Clare team when the six Clare players weren't playing the last game against Watford. That it was always this is a Tony Kelly team. They depend on Tony Kelly. They pro- proved that day. Yes, he's a valuable player, a brilliant, brilliant player. But there's other players in that team that can win matches for him too. I thought John Conlon was absolutely outstanding. I thought Conor Cleary, you know, gave Aaron Galan as tough a game as he's likely in to encounter over the next couple of years. I thought there was a lot of heroic. David Fitzgerald, five points from play out around the middle of the field. He's having a season to remember. His scores from out the field are being absolutely valuable to this player team. And Shane O'Donnell, as we said, is tackling. Pierre Duggan, just his kind of overall contribution to Gareth's physicality is definitely enormous to this team so listen an all around great team display I would say as well as a few great individual performances from Clare Maybe a feeling did you get in Semple Stadium itself Tommy when some of those key players like Duggan O'Donnell and Tony himself tired a bit in extra time and they had to come off that just maybe that was the difference between Clare and Limerick come the end that Clare maybe just ran out of steam a little bit in the added 20 minutes Yeah you see that, that's the thing with this Limerick team Will I wouldn't even put it on the Clare guys. I'd put this on the Limerick guys. Clare, they held Galan fairly well for large parts of that game. Um, they held Kyle Hayes. Paul Flanagan was absolutely outstanding. David McInerney was brilliant on Hego. Um, there was a lot of the Limerick team's players. They were coming up with, I suppose, plays at vital times. It was an overall performance that Clare guys really, really put it up to them. And... When all them guys were tied up, Seamus Flanagan steps up and scores eight points from play. Like, where else or what other team can do that? So I would put that down to more the strength of the the Limerick team as regards overall strength of their individual players and a couple of subs that came on. I thought Bynum was brilliant when he came on. David Reedy was brilliant when he came on. So I would put it more down to the strength of the Limerick players and panel than 
as opposed to their weakness in the clear side. Yeah, the big Limerick performer was Seamus Flanagan. He's so key to how they play, you know, creating space, breaking ball, uh, being that kind of target man in the forward line that's there to support Galan. And this time round, he did a lot of scoring himself. As you mentioned, eight points from play during the game. Took a little bit of criticism, didn't play all that well against Clare when they met the first time with the draw in Ennis. But he looked right back to his best form, Tommy, at the weekend. Yeah, and he's hardy. Like uh, I think reading from a couple of interviews over the years, he's a farmer, so he knows how to put in the hard yards. He's been, he doesn't mind criticism, I'd say, it just flows off the off his back and he just gets on with it. But that's the great thing about this Limerick, play, Limerick players, different guys step up on different days. Now, I do think not in the scoring fun, I thought they were full backline, put in huge shifts the weekend. And none greater than that diving block from Mike Casey on Shane O'Donnell. That looked like a certain goal. Like, if you can remember when Tom Marcy caught the ball in the first half, laid it off the head go, he still had a lot of work to do to score that goal. But Shane O'Donnell was through in a similar kind of a position, straight through the middle, maybe draw a guy and hand pass it off. But the Limerick backs, they kind of held it, held, made Shane O'Donnell make a, a decision quickly. He went for the shot. Across came Mike Casey. This is a guy come back from, you know, has a two cruciate knee ligament injuries, has m- missed major parts of the last couple of campaigns and comes up with a performance like that and a play like that. I thought that was, you know, gee, it was a heroic. It reminds you of Conor Gormley's block, JJ Laney's block back through the years. So, yeah, no, listen, I thought the Limerick full-back they were brilliant. Barry Nash, I think he deserves huge credit as well. This guy came from, you know, a star, he was a star underage player in the forwards. Wasn't quite making it but then the opportunity came in the backs where one of them or two of them are out injured at the time. They asked him to go back in the half back line and he's been just outstanding ever since. He's always an eight or a nine performer and looks like a guy with a great attitude. Is Barry Nash in the conversation for Hurler of the Year this year, Tommy? You know, like a lot of people will talk about forwards and how galan has been going and there was talk about Shane O'Donnell a few weeks ago and Dermot Burns has obviously been spoken about quite a bit. But like Nash has been remarkably consistent and he's put in a few all-action displays like the one we saw at the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, going on, on his performance to date. And it'll depend really, I suppose, Will, on who the All Ireland champions are. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, 99% of the time it's from the All Ireland champions. If that happens to be Limerick, like you'd be saying Sean Finn will be in the reckoning. You'd say Barry Nash will be in the reckoning. Burns will be in the reckoning. So there's so many players, Aaron Galan, as you said. And uh, no, definitely Barry Nash deserves huge credit. And like for a cornerback to be in line or be talked about for her year, he must be putting in some performances and he is and he's so adaptable which you need to be in the full back line in the modern game because a lot of guys play with two guys inside so they're able to leave Finn and Mike Casey inside and say Nash if we have to go out the field you follow the players out the field and listen this guy isn't come with no little pressure either you know his father and uncle played for the great Limerick team of the mid 90s so like this guy had a lot on his shoulders growing up and he's really living to, up to the expectations now after, you know, putting in maybe one or two or three years where, you know, it wasn't so easy. We got just the one goal in the game, but it was worth it for that one goal that was scored. Like, Morrissey catches the ball. I think his helmet starts to slip off slightly when he initially makes the catch. So he's to kind of readjust uh, with the face guard coming down over his eyes. Almost out of instinct, he pops the ball off over his shoulder to where Hegarty is making the run. And Hegarty has so much to do from when he catches that ball. If you're the clear defence, you're probably thinking, Tommy, we actually have a fairly good setup here. He's got two men to try and get past. He juggles the ball a la Gaza in Euro 96 to actually get himself into position. And the ball barely leaves his hurl for any amount of time before it's back and under control again. And then a wonderful finish across goal to put it in. Like one of the best goals we're going to see all summer. It is, Will. Uh, you're 100% on that. And I think Hegarty has... I suppose, delivered on the big occasions and big moments many times over the last couple of years. And it's very rare, I suppose, for a guy so tall, so strong to have the elegance that, that this guy has. Like, you know, he's this guy, I think he's six foot five. And he goes round with the stick as if he's, a, you know, five foot eight, five foot nine. That's the kind of magical touches that he's displaying. Um, like the, the goals he scored in the final last year, I thought was, they weren't just raspers. Let's hit this ball as hard as I can. He sold it in for me underneath the, the Hogan stand in the final last year and placed the ball from about 22, 23 yards out. Very difficult to beat goalkeepers these days from that far out. Again, Sunday, I thought, like, going back through the years of this Limerick team when they start in 2018, my four pillar would be the three guys in the half hour line, which is Hegarty, Keane Lynch and um, Tom Morrissey. And then throw in Kyle Hayes as well, say half backer. He's now in the full forward line. But they're my four pillars of this Limerick team. At the moment, Lynch was out. But the weekend, right, Kyle Hayes was, was under pressure. I thought Al Flanagan did a great job on him. But 
Tom Morrissey and Garrod Hegarty. Whilst the game, the ball, and say the game, their, their game wasn't flowing, they came up with just crucial, crucial scores at crucial times. And Tom Morrissey, he scored three points from play and caught that ball under two or three different guys. And then had to wear it all. Most guys, when the helmet came off, would have said, listen, play it up to be a free free in here, there'll be no advantage. But no, he'd wear the ball, less chance this, hand pass it into Hegarty, a flick over, like as Johnny said at the weekend, it was like Kevin Broderick in 2001 all Ireland semi final against Kilkenny, that famous score where he sawed it down underneath the Hogan stand, flicked it over, Kilkenny player back onto the hurl and then over the bar. That was, you know, being talked about for many years and still being talked about. This Hegarty goal will be talked about. For, for many years to come. And it wasn't just the flick over the, the head. It was the way he placed the ball. It was a greasy day Sunday, uh, Will. So the best chance of scoring a goal in a greasy day is bounce the ball low off the ground so it slides and skims nearly. Goalie doesn't know where to go as hard. And so listen, he, he, he did just that. Mm. You talk about the players that can come in and obviously Keane Lynch is going to be there to come back if he's fit for the semi-final. John Kiley, understandably, was kind of playing it down a bit when he was asked about it at the weekend uh, by Oshin Langan, who was with you at Semple. He said, we'll have to wait and see if he's back, but we've got the benefit now of a few weeks rest to maybe get Keane back. Seems it was a, a bad enough hamstring uh, tear with the amount of time that he's been out for. But he should come back in. He fits directly back into the system. He's so key to how they play. But it's such a benefit, Tommy, for them to be able to have players like Kyle Hayes who can play in multiple positions. Nash, you've mentioned him already. Like these guys who you could probably trust them to fit in for one of their key players being away. And Limerick will have probably found a lot more about their team having played three or four crucial games without Keane Lynch now. Yeah, and they have the, the, the benefit of being able to do that with how many other teams in the country can play with the likes of, you know, chance Kyle Hayes in the full forward line and hope it goes well. Like, you know, his form over the last couple of years as a wing back has been, we've been talking about him as hurler of the year at this stage of the year. Year in, year out, he's been just putting in enormous performances. At the moment, he's just putting in the hard yards for the team. And Limerick are able to do that because they've other players that, that can step in maybe and, and get the scores. Not every team can do that. Keane Lynch, in my mind, when he comes back fit, this isn't like an ankle injury where you're hardy. You get through it or you've a thumb injury or a finger injury. You, you get through it and you just take, it, take the, the belts and you take the pain and you get on with it. Hamstring, you can't do that. So John Kiley... He's clever in the fact that he knows if he brings him back too early, pulls the hamstring, he's gone for another six or eight weeks. He has, he doesn't really have a choice in this matter. He has to wait for Lynch to come back to full health. And I, I would predict that when he comes back, he'll be straight onto that team. How could you not put the two-time hurler year, an unselfish hurler, a guy that makes goals, he make, makes points, he scores points himself. So I reckon when he comes back, he will go straight onto that team. But well, I think this Limerick team... They've done the four and all in Munster now. They've won the Mick Mackey Cup for the first time. John Kiley has now moved up the list of all-time winning Munster championship uh, managers. Uh, Justin McCarthy is at number one with six. Number two, you have Babs Keaton and Bertie Troy with five. Now John Kiley moves up with Candle O'Brien and joined third on that list. Like There's records here now that this Limerick team, in-house they won't be chasing, but, but they are. And that's the fact of the matter. And it's great that they are doing it. It's the sign of a great team. This Limerick team is playing for greatness now. Like they're trying to get up there now with the great Limerick team of the 30s, the Tipperary team of the 60s, the Cork team of the maybe 40s, 70s, the Kenny team of the 70s, the Kenny team of you know the the, the Nauties, the Cork team of the that, that we played against in the Nauties. This Limerick team is they are a great team now, but where are they going to finish on the greatness scale? I think that's where we're heading with this with this Limerick team. Maybe the drive comes as well, though, from this Clare team and the way that they've been playing. Like f We were kind of throwing it about in the hurling pod with James Gell and with Paul Murphy this week, and we're thinking, has there been a better Munster final like in recent memory? When you take everything into account, the difficult conditions, the huge crowd that were packed in, you know, the game sells out in 11 minutes. So there was all the expectation and hype and the fact that they had the drawn game a few weeks ago, and it lived up to all of that, I think. Like Just the intensity of the game, the fact there was no space to be had whatsoever. Like I would think if you're a player, Tommy, you probably relish days like that where you were tested to your absolute maximum before you come off the pitch. Yeah, well, um, I'd say I agree with you in the fact that I'd say looking at a game anyway, it's the best game that I've ever been at and watching because it had everything. Some games are part of the game, whether it's high scoring or high physicality. Some games have the high intensity. This game had absolutely everything with it. Um, like it was a month, there was a Munster Championship there to be won. You had two border, border counties. 
you had Limerick versus Clary, the Mick Mackey Cup for the first time, the crowds, like I was there very early, but there was about an hour or two before the game, the the, the PA announcer was shouting, can, can the people please go up to their seats? So it was very wet down there, so they're obviously all huddling underneath the stand, back out in the tunnels, but there was such a crowd coming in, I would I, I, I guessed at the time that they wanted them all up into their seats for safety guys. This is what they're dealing with, the, the town end, the Klein end, both of them are full early, early in the day. And like, I think who deserves huge credit, Will, in, in I suppose, making making it a great day is the referee, John Keenan. Yeah. Because there could have been a thousand frees, Will, but he didn't because there was no real dirt. There was, it was everyone going for the ball. And sometimes when there's such huge intensity and physicality in a wet day, but listen, there can be technical fouls as such. But no, he let go. And let the best team win. And, you know, I don't think anyone can complain there was any dirt in the game. I thought it was played in the highest of spirits. So, like, if you look at the, the scoring side of it, you had Seamus Flanagan scoring eight points from play. You had Tony Kelly scoring seven. David Fitzgerald, five. You had um, Ryan Taylor scoring three. Just tr- Aaron Glad a tough day, but finishing with three from play. So, on the sc- and Gerard Hegarty's goal, you know, one of the goals of the ages. On the defensive side of it then, you had Will O'Donnell. Like, who puts him out over the line? Like, the, I don't know which clear guy he was, but he absolutely tunneled him outside the line. You know, and you never see that with any Limerick guys. You see in Tony Kelly getting hooked out in the line. I saw Ryan Taylor getting shoved out over the line. All in the proper way, you know, man to man, shoulder to shoulder. So it had everything. And then you had, I suppose, the bragging rights were on the line. And that was, you know, Clare versus Limerick. Clare would have liked to come in, I'd say, and win the McMackey Cup. They were trying to win the... First months or since 1998, um, like a lot of these players, Tony Kelly, David McInerney, um, you know John Connolly, all these guys, they've they've league titles, they have all Ireland titles, but they've no Munster championship, you know. And we all know the guys in Munster. You're from off the end from Kilkenny, which we hear about from the Munster counties all the time. Will they love the Munster championship? They take great pride in the Munster final and win the Munster championship medal. So that was on the line for the Clare guys. So. With so much on the line and so many great performances, I think always a sign of a great match is you could pick out seven or eight guys that were a man of the match, you know. OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor.